side. We not only have a quorum of the board, we have all board members present. So the State Board of Education meeting of June 12, 2018 is called to order. The first item on the agenda this morning is the approval of the agenda in the order of priority. Are there any items that board members would like to add or delete from today's agenda? I move the agenda as presented. Support. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed nay. Motion carries. Next is just a quick housekeeping item. The restrooms on this floor are still undergoing re renovations, so please know that there are restrooms on the main hallway of all the other floors in um, the Hannah building, and once again, we apologize for this inconvenience. At this time, Marilyn, I would like you please to introduce the State Board of Education members. I'm happy to do so. You've just been listening to the interim state superintendent, who's also chairwoman of the board, Sheila Alice. And next to her is one of the board's co-presidents, Richard Ziley. He resides in Dearborn. The board's other co-president is Cassandra Albrich. She resides in Rochester Hills. The board's secretary is Michelle Fecto, residing in Detroit. And Nikki Snyder is a board member from Dexter. Next to her is the seat for the Michigan Teacher of the Year. This current Teacher of the Year is Luke Wilcox, and he is not able to join us today. As we go across the table, Tyler Sawyer is representing Governor Snyder. He is the Senior Strategy Advisor for Education and Career Connections. Next to him, board member Eileen Weiser from Ann Arbor. Board member Lupe Ramos-Montini from Grand Rapids. Pamela Pugh is board member from Saginaw. Next to me is the board's treasurer, Tom McMillan. I'm Marilyn Schneider. I'm the state board executive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and now we will introduce new members to the Michigan Department of Education, beginning with Shulan. Would you please introduce new members to your division? Good morning. Shulan Doxy, interim deputy. I would like to introduce Lakeisha Williams, the biological part of the Child Development and Care Unit. I've been with the state of Michigan since 2011. So I'd also like to introduce Christina Adams with our Office of Great Start, Child Born, raised, and lived in Lansing, Michigan my whole life. Worked together. <laughs> so they were kind of mad when both of us left. Sorry. But I'm just really excited for some new opportunities. I would also like to introduce uh, at Lightborn with our Office of Special Education. On board, I uh, bring you experience as a psychologist in both Texas and Oklahoma. Most recently, you were at Detroit Public Schools as a psychologist supervisor as well. And last, I would like to introduce Mindy Westfield with our Office of Computer Science. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm coming to you. Uh, And uh, most recently, a middle school principal uh, liaison at the district level. Um, Exciting six days so far. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And that's our staff from the P20 division. Thank you. And Luana, would you please introduce new staff members to your division? Good morning, Luana Shelton, the special assistant with Dr. Vanessa Kiesler. Um, I would like to begin with a student assistant that we have hired, uh, Madison Kamishina. Adriana, hi. I'm Adriana. I am a student at Grand Valley State University. I've been here for eight weeks. 
<laughs> Good to know. So far. Thank you. And Joanna Parker, would you please introduce a member of your staff? Did we miss any new employees who are in the room? Okay, great. Well, welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for being with us this morning. Welcome. So now we'll go around the room and um, have the audience introduce themselves. And Marty, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Marty Ackley. I'm the director of the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs here at the Department of Education. All righty. I am Elizabeth Whiston. My husband was the former state superintendent, and I am also delighted to be here today. I'm Margaret Staunton, and I am a... Fran Luce, I serve as facilitator for Michigan Special Education Advisory Committee. Aisha Baldwin, Michigan Education Association. Okay. Loana Shelton, Special Assistant to Dr. Vanessa Kiesler. Dedrick Martin, Director for the Office of Partnerships, State School Reform Office. <laughs> 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 Good morning, Wendy Larvick, Chief of Staff to the Office of the State Superintendent. Carolyn um, I am the Legislative Liaison for the Department of Education. Thank you, everyone. If there's anyone in the room that plans to offer public comment at today's meeting, please complete a form and get it to Marilyn. Forms are available on the table outside of the boardroom and must be submitted prior to the beginning of the portion of the meeting devoted to public comment. Public comment will begin immediately following the lunch break scheduled for approximately 1 p.m. today. Please be here at the, that time to make sure that you have an opportunity to comment. Um, now we will move to the next portion of the agenda where our co-presidents of the State Board of Education Cassandra Albrich and Dr. Richard Ziley would like to share something with you. Brian Whiston served as state superintendent from 2015 until his passing on May 7, 2018. He has left a lasting impression of selfless public service. Uh, why don't we go up to the front of the room and... Very good. 
So Brian was most recently the state superintendent, but the reality is he touched a lot of lives throughout his career. Uh, you know, he was state superintendent for the last few years, but before that he was a superintendent at Dearborn Public Schools, where I know they thought just the world of Brian. And before that, and, and how I had actually first met him, uh, he was a director of government and community services for Oakland schools for many, many years. But even before that, he served as a local school board member for 17 years. So he impacted kids uh, in uh, his local school district as well. He was president-elect of the Michigan Parent Teacher Student Association, a teacher at Wayne State University, and a member of many boards and community organizations. Brian was a wonderful person who devoted his life to serving others. He was always focused on doing what is best for the children of Michigan. The vision he set up set forth to make Michigan a top 10 in education state in 10 years will endure. His leadership and talent established the dynamic strategies that will help all children in Michigan have the opportunity to learn and be prepared for success. That's from a uh, statement that uh, Cassandra Albrich and I issued on May 8th uh, in the Michigan Department of Education press release. May I add a, a personal observation? He, he was a great schmoozer and, um, <laughs> uh, and had a real gift for bringing out the best in other people. Um, when, you, when you can... When you can uh, uh, when you know how to work with other people, there's a temptation to manipulate others. But I always saw him use that to bring out the best in others, and his focus was on what good we can do in the situation. Uh, and I think his, his influence on the board, leadership of the board and meetings has really been a blessing to us. Uh, and personally, I admired his great courage. Uh, he knew uh, his, his days were numbered, uh, and he put that, uh, he expressed great concern and love for you, his family, uh, but also his work for the, the people of Michigan, and uh, I'm just so um, moved by his, his personal example. So I think we're all better for having known Brian mm -hmm. and having the honor and the opportunity to work with him. So a couple months ago, we started talking about ways that we really could honor Brian's legacy. And so I think over the next couple months, we're going to unveil a couple of things that will help um, uh, to highlight just how impactful Brian was to all of us. But it starts today with, um, with this plaque that, sorry, I need to get that out there so I can see. This plaque that is going to adorn the entrance to uh, this office here, uh, the office that Brian called home. And it is my honor and privilege to uh, present this beautiful plaque that everyone who comes into this office will see every time they enter this office. And the plaque says, in memory of Brian J. Whiston, State Superintendent, Michigan Department of Education, July 1st, 2015 through May 7th, 2018, whose vision and leadership set Michigan on the journey to becoming a top 10 education state in 10 years. We continue to honor Brian's legacy by striving to provide exceptional public service as we realize the goal of Michigan becoming a top 10 in 10 state. So this is not something that we put on the door and dust off every week, but rather something that we need to honor by our own professionalism and dedication to the cause that Brian led us in. And just one last thing, obviously, thank you to Brian's family for allowing him to spend the time he did away from you yeah. so that he could impact everyone else across the state. So thank you so much. Can we get a phone? Yes. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Can we 
have a photo too with the. I think all the board should be on the photo. <laughs> I'm kind of in between houses right now. <laughs> Eileen, we can't see you. I think the I think the acting superintendent should be with us. Yes. Yes. Interim. Sorry. Okay. That's great. All right. Thank you. I think we need Marty's yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, thank thank you. you. And you found a picture of him smiling. The little picture. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes, like, very you know, true. Like, yeah. okay. oh, that picture just really okay. captures yeah. his personality. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. He is. Yes. Exactly. That's a little Irish. Listen in his eyes. Yes. And I'm also very thankful that it's staying here. <laughs> I have so many plants and awards, I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful tribute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A wonderful man. So the we'll move on to the discuss discussion items. And the first item on the committee of the whole agenda is the presentation by First Robotics. In April, the Detroit First Robotics World Championship hosted over 15,000 students and 40,000 spectators, including 100 Michigan teams. Two Michigan teams, Strike Force from Kalamazoo and Team Rush from Clarkston, were part of the winning alliance for this year's game. Both teams are here to present to the Board of Education. This is an information item only, and our presenters are Michelle Rybent, Kyle Hughes, Kim Bruinwood. Welcome. And actually, we're going to flip around the teams and have Strike Force come up first because there was a slight delay for Team Rush. So, go on, sit down, have a seat. I would love to introduce our Strike Force team. Um, representing Strike Force from Kalamazoo, we have Coach Kim Brunwald, who's introduced herself, <coughs> Sierra Staunton, and Shearston Lindblom. And they're going to take over for the presentation. We'll have to probably flip the PowerPoint a little and go forward and then come back. There you go. I'll turn it over to them, but I do want to reiterate what, um, what Sheila was saying. We had a spectacular world finals in Detroit this year with over 15,000 students and 40,000 spectators from all over the world. It was quite an event and our victorious world champions, all of whom are here today, was super exciting. Um, we just want to recognize them for their hard work and then have them talk about what this has meant to them uh, and just re reminding everybody that the purpose of the grant, the FIRST Robotics grant, is to improve math, science, and technology skills. And this has been an exciting partnership with FIRST of Michigan and U.S. FIRST Robotics. So take it away. Thank you. Um, I'm Sierra Staunton. I'm a junior currently at the Porsche Northern High School in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I'm part of Strike Force Robotics team. We're a local community hi um, high school robotics team um, from 13 different school districts. Um, I'm Sherson Lindblom. I um, am a freshman this year, and then so this was my first time on the high school team. Um, so the mission of FIRST is to inspire um, young people to be 
um, science technology leaders and innovators by engaging them in exciting mentor-based programs that build science, engineering, and technology skills uh, that inspire innovation and that foster well-rounded life capabilities, including self-confidence, communication, and leadership. Um, it seems a bit ambitious, but first works. Um, the um, FRC involves 27 countries and over uh, 4,000 teams. 14% of those 4,000 teams um, are from Michigan. Um, and there are four programs for FIRST that are K through 12. Um, at Strike First, we help to uh, be part of the FIRST program. And FIRST stands for the for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. And we work to inspire others as well as being inspired in STEM. We spread STEM throughout the community through 45 different community events throughout the year. And we have an estimated exposure of about 80,000 people to STEM activities. Uh, we definitely make sure to um, inspire others in the amount that first has inspired us to spread the message that STEM is accessible to everyone and that you can make a career opportunity in STEM. Uh, we do this through mentoring students, education days, like I said, where we go and present our robot to schools. We do mini maker fairs where you get to play with robots and parts, go to library kickoffs and parades as well. Um, through Strike Force, not only have I inspired others, but Ben inspired myself. Uh, when I was in seventh grade, I was had the opportunity to be mentored by one of the high school students um, in the program, and it had left uh, like a definitely a big part of my life. Is because she's now my role model, and she's graduated college with a, an electrical engineering degree, and I still look up to her today. And it's kind of helped me connect with what I want to do, and that's a huge part of me today with that. Uh, through Strike Force, we also have uh, great opportunities to, to be recognized at an international level. Um, like Shirsten said, there's 27 countries involved in the first robotics competition, which is the high school program. And through the local level, we have sponsorship with community businesses, where we get to communicate to the businesses what our program is doing and have the opportunity to practice business skills with them. We also have community outreach events, internship and networking opportunities. Uh, when I was at this past current First World Championship in Detroit, I was talking to one of the people that was walking around that was a sponsor of the first program from Newport News Shipbuilding, and I was talking to him about the robot, and afterwards I mentioned that I was interested in naval architecture, which is what their company does, and I was offered an internship for my years in college. So it really does give you those opportunities to communicate to other people. We also have the fantastic um, opportunity to be recognized at a government level such as this, as well as meeting representatives and communicating with them. I never thought at 17 I'd be able to communicate with my representatives and be a part of a governmental process because I'm not 18 yet. I can't vote. <laughs> but um, through FIRST, I've been able to communicate with them, be recognized, and have some of our ideas been put into forth into government. So that's really cool. Um, also, Obviously, STEM is a big part of FIRST, and with science, we're able to bring those lessons that you learn in physics and um, computer science back out and into the real world and apply them automatically. We have to work with professional engineers and businessmen to practice our communication skills, build a robot that's 120 pounds in six weeks, and also really get to uh, practice those skills that you learn in a classroom setting on a robot in real life. Um, I personally this year uh, took physics alongside of doing this first robotics and it was probably the most rewarding kind of experience to be able to learn like friction and all these interesting concepts in physics and then actually go out and apply them. Um, I actually cemented my knowledge more in doing that than just studying and that's something I really hold dear to my heart of being able to do that. I also have the opportunity to work with technology. We have exposure to the engineering and fabrication process. A part of Strike Force is you don't need just design to design a part. You're designing for manufacturing and uh, actually building the part. And so you get to learn constraints that you wouldn't necessarily learn otherwise. You also have access to the technology to design those parts on software, and you have access to programming and seeing something move. Um, you don't, you're not just programming a website, you're programming and seeing the robot move, and that's something that's very tangible to people that not necessarily get um, just in a classroom, but you get outside with FIRST. Uh, with that along, uh, it also is great to be able to learn um, skill sets uh, that 
for the workplace uh, at Strikeforce. When I joined the program, I barely knew how to screw in a bolt. <laughs> and now I can weld, solder, and even a little bit of programming, even though it's not my favorite. So I'm here to tell you that FIRST works. I've had a great experience. I joined the team when I was in seventh grade uh, due to interest with my brother and my dad. And I've been in for five years now as a junior. As a 17-year-old, I never thought I'd know what I want to do and how I want to do it and where I want to go, especially with wanting to be a mechanical engineer and going into my senior year knowing, yes, this is where I want to, what I want to be. Um, I also have the opportunity to work with many professionals and get internships as a high schooler and work with the government in ways that I didn't think was possible. Um, I've also been able to meet wonderful people like Sherston and Kim, who's taught me the importance and, uh, and like leadership and everything. And that's really been a huge part of my life, and I'm really glad I can share it with you today. Um, if you had told me five years ago that I'd be presenting to a State Board of Education, I would have cried. Um, <laughs> I uh, have definitely grown the last five years and confidence, leadership, and I really would in debt to FIRST with that growth. So thank you. Thanks, you guys. We're going to transition now and bring up Team Rush from Clarkston, Michigan. And um, as they're coming up, we'll reserve questions for both teams till the end. So if Jason Richards, the coach from uh, Rush, as well as Valentina Vargas and Jessica Ray could join us at the table, we'll go back to their present, a part of the presentation. And I just want to mention that this is a grant that is administered through the Office of Systems um, Evaluation and Technology at our office, and we're in year five of this grant. Since we started five years ago with uh, legislative funding, we have more than doubled the number of teams and expanded down to the ju first junior league up through first Lego league and then uh, the tech challenge in middle school, which the last teammate was a uh, part of, and now the first robotics team. So go ahead, Clarkson, tell us your journey and your story that got you to be world champions. So I want to say thank you very much for inviting us here today. It's a great honor to be here in front of all of you guys. It's been a long journey for us, and I'm going to go ahead and let Val and Jester tell you a little bit more about our team. So hi, my name is Val and I'm one of the captains of Team Rush. I just finished my third year on the team and I'll be an incoming senior this fall. My name is Jessica, I'm also a captain. I just finished my second year on the team and I'm an incoming senior as well. So just like Jason stated, we'd like to thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here today. This is so incredible. And we'd, of course, also like to thank our mentors, our parents and our sponsors because fantastic programs like this really would not be possible without them. So Team Rush is based out of Clarkston High School in Clarkston, Michigan. We have 33 students, 11 of which are actually girls. And we've been through 22 years of robotics as a team, starting back in 1997 with our partnership with OSM Tech. OSM Tech has evolved into CSM Tech, which is Clarkston Science, Math, and Technology Academy. And this is a STEM-based program, which many of our students <coughs> are involved in. Team Rush also entered the first Robotics Hall of Fame in 2014 upon winning the Chairman's Award at the World Championship. This is an award um, given out by our parent organization FIRST to recognize teams that have become role models in their community. Over the past 22 years, Team Rush has become so much more than just robots. Even our name Rush stands for the four main core values that our team holds, respect, unity, spirit, and heart. And we go to employ these um, values in everything we do, both on and off the field. Everything we do is also focused around our mission statement. We aim to create self-confident leaders who inspire others to celebrate STEM. This is crucial to who we are as a team because it drives us to do more than just train our own students, but to inspire others in the community and spread the mission of FIRST. One of the main mottos that we had this year was fail faster, learn more, focus, and execute. And this shows that mistakes are inevitable, but if you fail more and you fail faster, you can learn more from your mistakes. So we will take these opportunities and apply them to the best of our ability. This principle is evident throughout a lot of our community events, and I think one of the best examples of this is through our annual Rush Regatta. This is actually one of the main fundraisers we have for our team, and last summer we garnered over $40,000 for our team. This involves cold calling local companies for sponsorship, but it also serves as an engineering challenge because students have to create boats out of nothing but cardboard and duct tape. And as one of the first events they participate in, the new students really get the opportunity to see how we take our failures and learn from them. And the regatta teams go through extensive prototyping and design challenges to see what the best boat design possible is. 
And some of the boats aren't always successful, like you might see in the pictures on the screen. <laughs> Sometimes they often sink, and this compels students to begin learning from their mistakes before a robotic season even begins. And it's really important to face that failure and fail faster while still having a lot of fun on race day. And the students in the boats are always laughing as they're sinking, and everyone's really in high spirits the whole day. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, it's really a true learning experience because we'll take those and we'll aim to improve our boats next year and hopefully not sink the following year. But learning more is not just something that we encourage in our own team, but also something we encourage when mentoring others. We aim to take everything that we learned and share our experiences with the lower level robotics teams in our community, whether it's FRC mentor camps for the high school teams, middle school FTC teams, or elementary school FLL and junior FLL teams. We're trying to take everything we've learned over the past 22 years and be able to expand that into our community. This allows us to continue growth and innovation with new robotics teams coming into the ranks and this really allows for the new generation to have better engineers as they move through the levels of first. We've also consolidated 20 years of successes and failures in our toolkit for success. This is a document that's pretty hefty, about 350 pages, and it describes everything from our best accomplishments to our biggest setbacks. It's been downloaded over 1,500 times across 49 states and 13 countries, and we hope that teams all around the world are able to learn from Russia's experiences. We hope to spread the principle of being motivated from our mistakes rather than discouraged. We want even the youngest members of FIRST to become inspired innovators and persistent problem solvers, and we will go and use this approach to become more successful in our future. Our own build season actually begins with kickoff, which is the first Saturday of January, and it's when FIRST says, go, now you have six weeks to build a robot. And no matter what part of the team that you're working on, we all come together to discuss and brainstorm the future design of our robot. And we start developing prototypes that often end up falling apart or breaking. I'm not going to lie about that. <laughs> but they're all very crucial into developing the understanding and gaining the knowledge necessary to come up with a robot design. And as Belle said, each prototype is truly a learning experience. Through this, we gain shop skills and more knowledge that really help to complete our robot and make it the robot that it was this season. And in addition, we also participate in what is called First in Michigan badges. And these are badges that you can earn through uh, leadership, communication, engineering, electrical, and machining. And so we are hoping that someday these will be incorporated and reward students, not only in robotics, but in the workforce as well as in classrooms. But the engineering process doesn't just stop there. Oh no. It continues long after build season as we are always trying to improve our designs. I think one really good example of this is actually our forklift mechanism that we had this year. We were constantly adding reinforcements, testing new materials, and examining other robots so that we could develop a me mechanism that was both successful and compatible with others. Tournament season is also filled with improvement, not only just on the robot. We are also working to focus and execute on the field. Our drive team is always working to improve strategies and being able to work with other robots on the field, which is why it is imperative for our drive team to be able to go and improve in every part of the competition. Whether it's creating new materials to share with other teams or improving the design of our robot, we're truly taking every learning experience and using it to continuously improve. Without failing, focusing, and executing, none of the successes we had this past season would be possible. Another one of the highlights we had this season was having our first ever real practice field. So thanks to Clarkson and Community Schools, we were able to have room for a full-size FRC field in one of our classrooms. And this has become a hub for robotics in Clarkston and in FIRST, and has allowed us to test and prototype and design faster than ever before. This was also gave us an opportunity to have drive practice whenever we needed, even during our 20-minute lunch times. It also allowed us to develop autons and strategies easier than ever, and it also helped expedite that engineering process. And so we were able to fail even faster, learn even more, and begin to execute before we even reached the competition field. So I think you can see that this key motto on our team was really what led us to be a world champion team. And so our sponsors, our families, our coaches, they have all allowed us to have this motivating and exciting environment where all of the students have grown exponentially on the team this year. And lastly, we would like to share one more event with all of you guys, and that is our National Advocacy Conference, which is actually taking place in two weeks in Washington, D.C. And this is an event that Team Rush helped found five years ago, where FRC 27, as well as other FRC teams from across the nation, will be going to D.C. to advocate for STEM legislation. And over the last 10 years, we have made 10 trips to our nation's capital, five trips here in Lansing, as well as had over 250 meetings with our representatives. 
representatives. We have trained 180 different registered participants from 25 teams representing 13 states this past year alone. And so our efforts at advocacy has led to specific legislative wording in the Every Student Succeeds Act relating to STEM-based after-school activities. And this is a replacement for the No Child Left Behind Act and allocates funding to states for programs such as FIRST. And I know that I've been to the National Advocacy Conference and I plan on going again this year. And it's just really impactful because I didn't think I would ever have the opportunity to talk in front of my nation's legislators and even be able to present today at the Capitol. We hope that one day all students across the state of Michigan and the United States will have access to a lot of the opportunities that we have been so fortunate to have. I know that my time on Team Rush and my time in FIRST has given me so many more skills than just how to build a robot, like going through a job interview, having a resume as a high school student, and having all these skills that are putting me so much further ahead than other students at my age. I know that our team motto, our core values, and our mission statement <coughs> expand so much farther beyond the competition field, and there will be so many opportunities waiting for me in the years to come. So I'd just like to thank you so much, and I guess now we have open up to questions. Yes. Well, a few minutes for questions. I would also like to say thank you for all of your guys' support over the last few years, whether it's with the teacher grants for continuing education for coaching a team or the stipends for that, or whether it's supporting the numerous amounts of teams that you've helped start here in the state of Michigan. It's a really, it's great. You can see how all the students have been impacted over just this last year. This has been going on for over 20 years now. It's been truly impactful and we really want to thank you with that. And we actually have, we have some Team Rush pins for you guys, <laughs> as well as a little frame for you guys from the World Championship. Oh, so it's a little you. gift from, a thank you from us to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first, let me thank all of the students who are here today and their supporters and their family members who are here um, and congratulate all of you on this amazing accomplishment. Oh, you must be so proud. Um, and as I'm sitting here listening to you, it is evident to me that you embody the mission statement that you have for each of your teams. And it's truly been a joy to listen to your enthusiasm and your energy and sharing with us your learning experiences and opportunities and all the fun that you had, even when you were failing. <laughs> um, so yes, we will now entertain comments and questions from board members. I, would just, I had my first opportunity. My dad made me go to uh, a first robotics <laughs> competition in Midland in March, and I was with uh, Trobots, uh, so it's Saginaw High Trojans. And so it was really exciting to see, and the excitement. Uh, I got uh, quite a bit of the footage from, from that, but it was really exciting to see. And so I just commend you and, and thank you for your advocacy and all that you're doing uh, to move this work forward and for encouraging us all to learn from our failure and to fail faster and learn from it. So thank you. Okay. I was a teacher for many years and you all are outstanding. You got an A plus today, <laughs> you got a big A plus. I'm really encouraged, and I'm very, um, I don't know what word to use. I, I'm just so proud of the success that you have had uh, with this robotic uh, program. You are on your way to great successes in life. This is preparing you for the future, and it is just amazing to see. I, my daughter is an engineer, a mechanical engineer. Somebody said mechanical engineer. So you all are preparing yourself for that. Let, I'm just going to tell you the story of how she got to be a mechanical engineer. When she was a senior in high school, Forest Hills Public Schools, she came to me and she said, I want to continue going to school, but I don't know what to study. And I said, Irma, you're very good in math. You're very good in the computer. You're very organized. You're very enthusiastic about your learning. You're going to be an engineer. And she said, I don't know what that is. I said, I don't either, but we're going to learn together. <laughs> and she got a dual uh, engineering degree, mechanical and manufacturing. So I commend you. You're on, you're on to great success. Cassandra? 
Uh, you guys did a fantastic job today. Congratulations. Um, and uh, I love hearing the fact that not only are you interested in the STEM fields, but you're also advocating, uh, which takes a lot of additional critical thinking skills to be able to sit in front of some legislators and tell them what they need to be doing. So <laughs> congratulations on that. Um, yes. To the strike force, did I hear you that you have 13 different school districts as part? Logistically, how does that work? So we have 13 different school districts. We're underneath a 4-H uh, program uh, through our local community, and we meet at a one local build space. It's uh, one of our sponsors was uh, very kind to give us a space in a warehouse, uh, Midlink Business Park. And so it's kind of a central location for all of us, and it's kind of difficult um, getting uh, students to like have opportunities like this because a lot of us are still taking exams currently and so we had to rearrange exams or communicate with different schools and it's something we're working on currently is uh, communicating with all those different schools that were gone multiple times for the competitions and but I think I wouldn't have it any other way I would have never met Shearston and I would have never met so many people because of um, without just being in one team so and for those of you who are seniors, where are you going? Uh, I'm currently a junior. But I think they're all juniors all junior. and a freshman. Oh, I'm sorry. I I, I'm a, a senior. I'm going, to, <laughs> I'm going to Wayne State next year to uh, study accounting, uh. so I'm looking forward to that. And I've learned so many skills here. I have a resume that I know I can go. I have a job working for a website development company right now <laughs> that I was able to take the day off to come spend with you guys. So, <laughs> And to just tell my story and say that this is such a great program and it's done so much for me as a student. And I plan to give back even so I can help even more kids that everyone I think should have an opportunity like this. Well, I used to work at Wayne State and Michelle currently works at Wayne State. So if you need yeah, anything. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I was uh, wondering, did you, did you see the team members, maybe the freshmen and sophomore, they, when they came on the, the team showed that there was kind of increased their their passion for even coming to school. I mean, maybe, or even, I don't know, did, did it make it something that was more interesting or more fun to get to school? Not just fun in a, in a playful is. way, but, you know, just really being able to engage some of their passions. I'm wondering about that. And two, was it difficult fitting this into, you mentioned exams and stuff, was it, were, are there difficulties and perhaps could the state do a better job in maybe making sure these opportunities exist and maybe making it easier to make these opportunities exist? I think as far as encouraging schoolwork, it definitely has helped. A academics always come first, and at least on our team, if you don't have the grades, you aren't allowed to travel, and that's just because we want all of our students to also be succeeding inside of the classroom. But I think one of the great things about being part of a robotics team where you have ninth through 12th graders or even more is that you have students who have taken those classes before. You have students who have experience and have the knowledge, and so we We've seen a lot of students grade improve because they now have study buddies or they have people that will tutor them. Mm. And so they're less scared for that Algebra 2 test that is coming up in a week because they've been studying with the juniors and seniors on the team. And we're really happy to help them because it then means that they can enjoy and have fun and apply that learning and knowledge into robotics and increase um, all of the potential that they have along with being on the team. Yeah. Um, I uh, second and third all the previous comments about how wonderful you are <laughs> and what a great job you've done. Um, my question is, um, who teaches you and how do they coordinate with your regular science and math teachers? So are there, are there some of the coaches are the science and math teachers? Are they people that, you know, um, do they work together in, in some way? Um, and... Uh, or to help you apply um, the knowledge, is there, or is that something you just pick up in the program that you're in to, you know, you figure out how to apply what you've learned in the classroom. So I'm just wondering about the jump from the classroom knowledge and how that's, if there's any coordination with uh, the teachers and the coaches. So with on every team, it's a little bit different. We have one of our main coach and leader, Kyle Hughes. She, is, uh, my cal she was my calculus teacher this past year. So I'll be learning math during the day, and then I'll go and be robots in the afternoon. So 
we, we saw a lot of each other. But otherwise, we have mentors that come in from professional businesses, whether they work with with businesses like the FCA, FCA, Cooper Standard, or just different automotive industries, and they come in and help us and teach us. Some of them are even our best tutors as well for helping us out with those crazy complex AP physics problems that they've seen before in their job. And they, can, they show us not only how it applies, but how we can use it in our classroom as well. And then also with on Rush specifically, we have a mentor-mentee program. So when all the new students come onto the team, they then have, they get an older mentor student that they get to look up to. And if they have any questions, it's about like, what's the process behind this different thing? Or what's the process behind this? Or I want to learn machining. Who should I go to that? And we have student leaders on the team that then teach other students. And that way, everyone is learning from each other. So that's how it runs, at least on Team Rush. And a majority of other teams have similar programs. Ours runs a little bit different because we're community-based. So, you know, we don't have one specific school that we partner with. Um, that was one of our first sponsors. That was one of their main objectives, is they didn't want to say, we're going to sponsor you and give money to the community, but only to one school, we want to make it accessible to everyone. So we don't start meeting until 5 o'clock every day because that's when most of our mentors get off work. And there are a lot of engineers from Stryker and a few other places. And so we, there's no coordination, per se, with the school. I think also um, something unique that we've been able to do, like we mentioned, is that um, our main team leader is also a teacher in our CSM tech program or our specialized STEM program. And so we've actually been able to integrate over 15 different technologies from FIRST, like Illustrator or doing a week of FLL robots with our students in that program. And so students that join Rush as a freshman or a sophomore might have already seen some of these technologies because it's integrated into this specific STEM program. And I think that's a really unique opportunity that we've been so fortunate to have and to encourage within Clarkston. And I think something I would really hope to see in the future is First of Michigan badges launched just two years ago. And I think it's so great to have a way to recognize students that is tangible, that you can show to employers, but I hope it's also on the road to helping us gain credits in school because of the challenging physics courses. You might not always get to take that fun engineering CAD course. And so if we could take our badges and apply those to credits in school, that would just make it so much better because we're widening our knowledge in a way that colleges can recognize that even easier. Um, to add to that on Strikeforce, the community like idea where the students are helping each other is very prevalent as well. I recently completed a research project for physics where I had to build a hovercraft that people could sit on, and I literally had four or five mentors like, oh, I can help you with that, and also um, a couple students that had done it before that were also willing to help me. And it was um, great not having to do that all by myself because <laughs> uh, it was kind of a hefty project. Um, and we also have opportunities where um, like Kim said, our mentors are professional engineers and businessmen, so they definitely come in. And we also have a couple um, opportunities like that where you get to uh, see what engineering really is. And I know personally at my school, there's no opportunity to do anything but math science. There's not really a technology course. There's no really drafting course. You do art or you do science. And it's really nice to be able to combine those two and to do engineering um, at robotics. Well, thank you very much for being here. And once again, congratulations on being world champions in FIRST Robotics. That's oh. really an amazing. <laughs> and we wish you all the best as you start preparing for next year's competition. <laughs> we hope to see, see you back all next in year. Detroit. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> the next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is a presentation on partnership district model. And today we have an opportunity for Detroit Public School School District, Community School District, to provide an overview on the progress it is making in the partnership model in conjunction with the district's Blueprint 2020 plan. 
And joining us this morning, a welcome to Dr. Diedrich Martin, Dr. Nikolai Vitti, and <coughs> Ms. Gloria Chapman. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as a follow-up to previous conversations and requests from the Board of Education, uh, we wanted to take an opportunity to um, allow a couple districts to come in and um, highlight some of the great works that they're doing early on in the partnership. And so certainly uh, a gentleman that, that doesn't need to be introduced, and I think everybody know has one of the uh, uh, biggest tasks in the state, has uh, jumped in uh, full force uh, and is starting to uh, put together some great things that we feel good about as it relates to the partnership. And so without further ado, uh, while, while I help from a distance, uh, I got to give a lot of credit to Ms. Chapman. She uh, works with them quite frequently. Uh, just being a link between the Department of Education and how we can support them through our partnership efforts. Uh, but with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Beatty so that he can go through his presentation and then we'll leave some time at the end for questions. Okay, okay good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, good morning. Thank you for the invitation. I look forward to um, reviewing for you our work uh, with our partnership schools and also giving you a uh, broad overview of uh, a year's work right now. Uh, with DPSCD. Um, so uh, as you well know, uh, 20 school, 22 schools were initially identified as part of the partnership agreement. Um, the goals that are set for those schools um, have to be uh, implemented and obtained by April 20, uh, 2020. And then another set of schools were identified in November 2017, 24 schools. Um, those goals have to be met by November 2021. And then lastly, uh, this past March, an additional 13 schools were identified, uh, and those goals need to be reached by July 2021. Um, as we think about uh, the partnership agreement, so walking into the district uh, about this time a year ago, obviously the first set of schools had been identified, and broadly uh, a set of strategies were identified to improve those schools. Um, luckily, when, when um, coming into the district, uh, myself and the team that I've been able to recruit have had a track record of improving low-performing schools. Um, and so as we uh, started our work, uh, it, it didn't take us long to identify gaps that existed with these low-performing schools and, and gaps a, as far as the entire district is concerned. As I talk about the strategies that we're using in the partnership schools, you'll see some uh, obviously similarities in alignment with the overall work that we're doing as a district in, in reform. Um, but we are going a bit deeper uh, with our partnership schools because they need additional support, uh, obviously, as we uh, rebuild the district as a whole, but move student achievement in these schools. Uh, so in the first couple of months uh, in the district, we engaged the board about very uh, specific goals related to these partnership schools, uh, related to proficiency and growth. Uh, those goals were approved by the board after a couple of months in the district. Um, and uh, actually tonight, uh, we have a board meeting, and the board will be approving our partnership agreement plan, which really outlines what I'm about to present to you right now regarding our focus areas uh, in improving our partnership schools. Uh, I'll be talking about four focus areas in improving uh, our partnership schools. One focus area is um, providing additional support around human capital, um, focusing on our teachers and leaders. Uh, the other focus area is about um, strengthening uh, our, our curriculum, so just rigor in the classroom. Uh, our other focus area is around expanding wraparound services. And then lastly, our fourth focus area is improving um, parent and overall community engagement in these particular schools. Um, so what you see on the slide uh, right now is focus area one, uh, which is around, uh, is focused on human capital. The, the, the best proven way to raise student achievement is to improve the quality of instruction in the classroom. Uh, the core of all reform happens in the classroom. So a lot of our focus obviously is is on our teachers and, and the individuals that directly support them every day, our principals and, and assistant principals. So the first area um, of, of the first gap or major gap was around um, teacher salaries. So 
Historically, Detroit has been unbalanced when you look at teacher salaries. Uh, we uh, have re we reached a three-year agreement with our uh, our union, Detroit Federation of Teachers, um, to not only raise teacher salaries but provide a bonus for those teachers uh, most likely to retire. Um, Sixty-five percent of our teachers are on the highest step, um, so we're already facing a teacher shortage. If we lose those teachers, that would only be exacerbated. So that was our focus area, but also increasing our first year teacher salary. We were at the bottom of uh, districts um, compared to, comparable to us. We are now at the middle based on this new agreement. Uh, but more important to that is thinking about a pipeline development as these teachers retire and as we try to recruit teachers. So a lot of our partnerships are with universities. You see them listed there, Eastern Michigan, Michigan State, University of Michigan, and Wayne State. And our commitment is to place more student teachers in Detroit during their, teacher, their student teacher experience so that we can hire those teachers uh, after their um, student teaching is completed. But we're also thinking about residency programs. Uh, we have to move away from teachers uh, uh, learning on the job and instead being more thoughtful about teachers learning in the classroom before they're a student or before they're the teacher of record with a master teacher. So um, this year we are developing residency programs that will place uh, undergraduates that did not major in education uh, in the classroom to learn how to teach over the over a year or a year and a half before they become the teacher of record. And that's the way we're thinking about pipeline development um, for uh, uh, our partnership schools. We've done a lot of work on the new standards. So obviously the Common Core standards were implemented in Michigan a couple of years ago. Detroit has been behind in training our teachers on those new standards. So uh, we have focused this year on literacy and math at the K-8 level. Uh, we've had uh, a number of, of trainings uh, after school on the weekends uh, for our teachers and our leaders. Uh, and we partnered with Achievement Network to provide that training. Uh, we have been uh, conducting walkthroughs with Wayne Risa and MDE where we visit classrooms and talk about what good teaching and learning looks like, building the capacity of our leaders to provide solid feedback to our, um, our teachers uh, to improve instruction. Uh, next year, we're starting a uh, new leaders development program where we're taking assistant principals and over a year's time, um, training them to be instructional leaders, not just managers of buildings. Uh, and we're doing that with private dollars raised through the Detroit Children's Fund. Um, and then lastly, we will be matching the first cohort of partnership uh, schools uh, with CEOs in, in the city and Metro Detroit in general, because we believe that there's an opportunity for principals to learn from uh, business executives and business executives to learn from principals as well. This just allows for networking, but also a better understanding of the, the beauties and the beasts of what I talk about as far as traditional public education is concerned. So that allows uh, our leaders to uh, get out of their buildings. Often our principals are, are um, go to the same building every day, see the same challenges, and they're not growing professionally by seeing other ways of work. And likewise, the business community often doesn't see the challenges in our schools. Uh, as I talked about, um, our, our second focus area is improving our, our, the content that's uh, applied in the classroom every day. I talked about our teachers not being fully trained on the new standards, but our curriculum has been inadequate as far as meeting the expectations of grade level standards based on the, the new standards. I shouldn't even say new anymore, but they're new um, for teachers that have not been trained in using uh, curriculum. We went through a curriculum audit district-wide, not just for the partnership schools. And that curriculum audit in literacy and math uh, demonstrated that our curriculum is not only outdated, but not aligned uh, to the standards. And that's an important uh, factor because if teachers are using curriculum that are, are below the expectations of grade level standards, then they have to spend the time and energy to supplement that curriculum to ensure that students are being exposed to grade level standards. If you're teaching sixth grade math and your curriculum is at a fourth grade level, um, even if students are below grade level, they will never catch up. They will never meet grade level standards, which then means, as you all know, they'll never be college and career ready. 
Um, so by um, going through this audit and training our teachers on the new standards, we've asked, actually raised the capacity of our teachers and their awareness to pick curriculum that's highly aligned to the standards. So we engaged over 100 teachers, um, some of them in the partnership schools, uh, to adopt new curriculum, which we have adopted and we will be implementing this um, fall. Uh, I think it's a challenge that doesn't only exist in Detroit, but throughout the state of Michigan, that we have used traditional vendors and traditional adopting processes rather than engaging practitioners themselves and training them on what aligned curriculum looks like. Um, and so we're excited about that next step for us. Uh, also, beyond just grade level expectations, a lot of our students, as you know, are below grade level. Um, and so we have to do more work in the classroom in identifying the deficiencies that exist for not being at grade level. So we uh, have um, uh, used iReady as an adaptive um, diagnostic tool starting at the K3 level. We did that because of the new retention law um, and focusing on our early learners to ensure that our teachers know exactly where their deficient are uh, based on the um, on, on the foundations of reading, and our teachers are now able to implement in small group interventions to, keep, to catch those students up, uh, certainly before third grade, but that's something that we're applying across our district um, next year at grades K through eight in reading and math. This not only allows teachers to know if students are on grade level or not, but what deficiencies exist, but there's an online platform that allows them in small groups or on the computer to catch up as they go through mo modules, identifying those same areas that were diagnosed as deficiencies. I'll talk more about how we're supporting teachers beyond just a diagnostic tool and a platform that will be used for that. Um, obviously, um, education is about reading, math, science, and social studies, but we know when we don't uh, look at the whole child and we don't address issues outside of academics, sometimes we don't even focus on academics or the child is not focused on their academics. So a lot of our work in the partnership schools is trying to expand wraparound services with uh, community par partners, with um, uh, city resources, state resources, and trying to bring them to the school rather than um, putting a burden on parents to navigate through red tape and often bureaucracy. And so, um, uh, starting mainly with mental health detection and support, our vision is to work with the Wayne Mental Health Authority to place mental health specialists in our schools um, so that that way they have daily direct access to our students and, and their parents uh, when mental health uh, issues are detected and needed. Our vision also is to create full service schools so that parents and students can gain direct access to dental um, support, medical support, and as I mentioned, mental health support. But this, we believe, will allow us to uh, overcome the obstacles that uh, are getting in the way of students focusing on their education every day. Uh, we're also expanding City Year. If you don't know about City Year, th those are AmeriCorps volunteers um, that are that directly connect with kids because of their youth and also their own experiences. We use them to focus on truancy. Um, but also academic intervention in uh, literacy and math. Um, so we are looking to expand that in our partnership schools and also um, creating better data systems around truancy and attendance, which I'll talk about that district-wide in a moment. And then finally, um, expanding parent and community engagement. Uh, our district was one that did not have PTA. Uh, th those were decisions that were made previously by emergency managers. But we have reestablished um, PTAs throughout our district. Now, 80, 80, over 80 schools um, of 115 have PTAs. Um, so that's something that we've reestablished. In addition to that, uh, we are creating school advisory councils at every school. 51% uh, or more of that council has to be made up of non-district employees. And the school advisory council will approve the school school improvement plan, discipline plan, attendance plan, enrollment plan. Uh, the, the school advisory council is led by the principal, but made up of um, our union representative, our PTA uh, president, but also students, um, parents, business partners, faith-based partners, and that's um, bringing in the community into the school to own the improvement plan of the school. 
Um, we've also um, created a parent academy uh, district-wide, and I'll talk about that as I, we talk about the district as a whole. So I'll just stop there before I get into the district um, overall work in case you may have any questions about partnership schools. Yes, Eileen. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, when um, uh, the uh, essential practices for literacy instruction were discussed here at the state board, I think in March, one of the comments that was made was that it was difficult uh, to, not so much to work with uh, Detroit, but um, they weren't seeing the progress or the fidelity, I think would be a good word, to the model uh, in Detroit. And I wondered what you are finding is working. So just to clarify, that's around the, the early literacy work, I'm correct? Sorry, yes, yeah. I agree. Um, so I, I think um, the feedback has improved uh, as of late, from my understanding, um, regarding the implementation of uh, the interventions that are required at the K-3 level. Um, through iReady, not only have we now identified specific data related to where students are deficient, um, but that, that tool has allowed us to give data reports to not only teachers but parents. Uh, we've, had, uh, we've sent letters to parents um, whose children are below grade level. We've had parent nights to talk about strategies to, that can um, support uh, readers that are not at grade level at home. Um, and so uh, we actually, and, and we have been well positioned um, for the third grade retention work because many of the cabinet le leaders, as well as myself, have the history in Florida of third grade retention and the interventions that are needed um, to not only be compliant, but just based on best practice. So I think we've made quite a few inroads in regard to being compliant in that area. It's not so much compliance. I'm just wondering if, if there's other interventions that you're finding are working better in a big city district. Yeah, the only, the only I, I think, I, I wouldn't say working better yet, but I think the opportunity is there's a lot of energy around early learning. So even before kindergarten. And um, in my experience, the opportunity lost is to build off of that early learning intervention in the kindergarten. And what I mean by that is ensuring that curriculum is aligned in the, in the, in, in the pre-K and Head Start, um, that we consider cohorting students that were involved in early learning so you can build off of that um, intervention. Those are things that we're going to start looking at as we go into the fall. Um, but, but nothing in particular that I would recommend that, that right now are gaps as far as the, the current structure of the requirements. Thanks for being here, Doctor. Uh, so several, uh, Michelle and Cassandra and I met with some teachers, I don't know, probably a year ago now almost, and we heard from some kindergarten teachers uh, in the urban areas that said that these, and it might be I ready, but there's something that they had to do 80 observations per child twice a year that were just preventing them from actually, they felt teaching the children what they thought was best for them, instead had to worry so much about just doing, you know, doing the paperwork and doing these observations and getting in the pressure. You know, is there a, I guess, are you making sure that you're, you know, you got your, that there's good, uh, you know, bottom-up communication and that you're really understanding the impact of some of these that, um, you know, sometimes things sound good in theory, but when they're actually in practice, they can do more harm than good. So, you know, that, that's one of my questions. But if you want to answer that sure. one. Sure. Um, so w one of the things that, that we did um, around this time last year is review the previous year's assessment calendar. And what we saw was excessive duplication of testing. Uh, we saw a lot of testing that was not directly aligned to not only the standards, but aligned to MSTEP. Um, and so if a, you know, the, the, at the end of the day, if a test doesn't give a teacher data to inform instruction and, and thinking about the end in mind, which, which right or wrong is the state assessment, MSTEP, then, then it really isn't needed. Um, so we dramatically reduced testing in the district going into this year. And um, yes, there was state uh, requirements regarding K-3 testing, 
But we tried to make the conversation not about being compliant, but instead having data to inform intervention and instruction at the K-3 level. So uh, the diagnostic is computer-based. Um, there are some uh, direct um, assessments used with kindergartners, especially in the beginning. But most of it is computer-based, so it limits the direct um, assessment that teachers have to give. Um, outside of when you really get into students being significantly below grade level, where you go deeper in order to understand what um, particular issues exist in the literacy continuum. But the feedback has been positive from teachers in Detroit around the shift in assessments. One, there are fewer assessments, and they're finding that the assessment is yielding more actionable data rather than data for the sake of data. And what about observation? I mean, have you heard of something like this, 80 observations? Yeah, I think, it depend, I, mean, it I think it depends on the tool that different districts are using regarding the number of assessments uh, that teachers have to do directly. Okay, and then the second question would be, I hear a lot about uh, identifying deficiencies and working on them, but as Dr. Uh, Young Zhao would say, you know, maybe we shouldn't spend as much time on fixing deficiencies as enhancing passions and interests of children to make sure that they actually you know, enjoy, you know, there's a reason to come to school, they kind of enjoy it, not that it's a arduous fixing right. me all the time kind of thing. Is that, you know, is there a balance there that you're working to make sure occurs? Absolutely. Um, so as I talk about our district-wide work, I, I think you're, you'll, see, you'll hear a lot of emphasis on the whole child. Um, and that's where, for example, we're expanding music and art in all of our schools in the fall. Okay. Um, we're expanding our career academies at the high school level and ensuring that there are programs up and down. Um, obviously, you heard a presentation about the first Lego League uh, this morning. That's something that we hope to expand in every school by the fall of next year. Um, so that's a lot of our work. But I will say, you know, as um, a, a child who um, was dyslexic and 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 Two of my children are dyslexic. I do think, as a whole, we have to do a better job of, of diagnosing deficiencies early in the, in, the, in the reading continuum. And I don't think it's bad to say that, um, because if we can identify areas, and we have to also recognize, as I think you're alluding to, every child learns differently. Every child's brain is programmed differently. I think we have to make the conversation not about being punitive, but being supportive, but, but also being intentional about intervening. Because if we wait too long, then we're playing the catch-up game one way or the other. So I, I, I think you know, the, the positive aspect of the third grade retention law could lead to better practice around detecting deficiencies. But if we only stay in the, in the space of accountability and sanctions and and, and being punitive, then we lose the opportunity to build better systems of support and best practice. Um, I think as a state and as a nation, we have to completely rethink um, the requirements that our early learning teachers have or, or regarding um, certification and just teaching. Um, our colleges of ed have to do a better job of teaching specifically how to teach children how to read. Um, and then districts have to be aligned to support that work moving forward and not abandon uh, that. So just better alignment between what universities are doing and districts are doing. But, um, you know, there isn't a hundred different ways to teach a child how to read. Uh, it's called best practice and then it's called research. And I think we have to commit to that and be true to that and to continually support teachers in implementing that process and not abandoning it. Um, and then because we know all children are different, when they're not learning like other children are learning, then what are we doing differently to intervene, to individualize instruction, to go deeper in the process so that we don't, the problem isn't on the child, um, but, but then the opportunity becomes how to teach that child differently. That's what we're not doing well enough, and I'm afraid that the conversation will be about penalizing children, schools, and teachers rather than focusing on best practice and intervention. Okay, I have Michelle, Cassandra, Pam, and Nikki. <laughs> Hi, it's, I'm Michelle. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, <clears throat> uh, I live in Detroit, and um, uh, I've raised a lot of children in Detroit and gone to Detroit public schools. I started in 
first child went in um, 1994, and so when the charters first started appearing, and um, so I've and I've uh, been dealing in with Detroit Public Schools for a long time, and I I celebrate a lot of the good things, but the emergency managers have been incredibly frustrating to deal with, and a lot of the policies and their lack of responsiveness to the parents and to the teachers and to anybody but the governor. Um, so, uh, so I wanted to commend you for a lot of the changes that you're making as a parent. I see them as being incredibly positive, like for example with the PTA instead of the structure that was there before, which I didn't feel was accessible to me as a parent. Um, and the music and arts in the schools and all the things that you're saying, um, supporting the teachers. Um, so. Uh, so I, what I've seen um, from talking to the teachers and from being a parent myself, I'm also a foster parent, so I've also dealt with a number of families um, that have that needed a lot of the services that you're talking about with the wraparound, and I think that's really critical. Um, so some of the, the concerns I had was the class size, mm -hmm. which were astronomical. Um, and uh, sometimes having teachers who were not certified to teach. They were friends of the principal that were hired. And um, so uh, in the lack of books, uh, the kids didn't have to have books to take home. Uh, and I've also heard from teachers about very poor implementation of teacher evaluations. Not with you. I mean, this is sure. prior to yeah. you. Um, who We've lost a lot of good teachers, great teachers because they, um, and committed because of these, uh, the way that they were so punitive and, and um, they weren't fair, basically. Um, so uh, I wanted to know, um, it, has there been progress made on class size? Um, and, uh, and is there an effort around, you know, there's also the issues with mobility, like I know parents bounce around from school to school, right. and how do you track progress? I mean, it just some of it just seems so overwhelming to me sometimes, and I can only imagine how, I like how do you sleep at night and thinking about all <laughs> these problems? Um, so, so I would like to know what your what has uh, being done around um, to develop more um, trust with the teachers. And um, to, to, you know, listening to their direct input, kind of what, what Tom was saying, um, and um, particularly with the with the issues around absenteeism, um, is there a, a program you said you were going to get to it? Maybe you'll get to it later on a, on addressing because I see that as being really key to to progress, um, and I don't. It's a really hard issue to bear. I know I'm just throwing a whole bunch of stuff at you, but um, the other final thing I wanted to just throw in there um, is I've also uh, been on a number of task force looking at Detroit schools around special education. And um, what is clear to me is that the charter schools are not accepting the, uh, the more, uh, the kids that are harder to teach. And so we have this huge uh, disparity between the traditional publics, and then the charters. And then they compare them, <laughs> which I think is grossly unfair. Um, but I think Detroit is still holding its holding up. Um, do you, so on the issues of teacher, class size, absenteeism, and then this issue of special education, what are your uh, thoughts and your priorities around dealing with those, and I'm sorry, I just yeah, no, no, no. I, I think I think some of that um, I would get to in in the latter part of the presentation, okay. I'll, but but I can address them now. Way. It's it's up to you. Um, so last year at this time, uh, we had about 275 vacancies. Those are classroom vacancies. Um, so the class size problem is is not necessarily a budgetary issue. It's more of a hiring teachers issue. Um, and so um, last year, as I said, 275, with 250 more classrooms added to DPSCD with the transition of the EA schools back, 
So you're, we added 250 more classrooms, roughly, uh, and so that comes with more teachers. Right now we have 200 vacancies. So we started the year with 160. So we've actually done a better job apples to apples with hiring teachers and retaining teachers this year as compared to last year. Um, I'll talk about some things that we're doing um, starting this summer to improve that um, later in the presentation. Um, and I think it'll speak to the, the issue of filling those vacancies. Um, I think uh, most teachers, if you randomly polled them, would say that they feel the district is much more responsive than it's ever been in the past. Um, not only do I actively respond to my emails, we have a clear constituent response system where we're, we track requests and, and we actually respond. Um, I've been, I've, I visit schools rather frequently, always asking teachers um, what's working, what's not, what do we need to do differently. I run something called chat with the soup um, where I have um, just tables like this or um, uh, a, a setting like this where I don't come in with pre-crafted uh, questions um, and no media is there, not a publicity stunt, and teachers can just be frankly honest with where the district is, what's working, what's not. Um, but I think a lot of our work this year was about building trust um, by listening. Um, and then responding to those issues. And that's why morale, I think, is slowly improving, especially among our teachers. Um, and the work is um, not only child-centric, but also teacher-centric, knowing that those are our most important employees in our district. Uh, and that, that's not just rhetoric. I think that that's what the, I think teachers are more hopeful, optimistic, and they see signs of the district now um, actively using the, op, the um, the responsibilities, authority of the district for good. I know that sounds rather simple, but I, I think one of the downfalls of emergency managers, and this isn't about one in particular, is they weren't in educational leaders. So they didn't really know how to leverage district office to, to create change, um, to, to create reform. So if you haven't done it before, you're not trained to do it, how can you really use systems and processes to scale improvement? Um, it just wasn't done. It was the district was just run, um, not run to create social change and transformation. Um, it was just managed. And I think now people are actually seeing the district being leveraged to create that comprehensive visionary reform, although it will take time, people see signs in the right direction. Um, we are creating an attendance policy um, for students. Um, and um, creating better tracking systems. I think one challenge is just data um, and being sure when students are, um, how consistently schools, uh, children are absent, um, but also providing resources to follow up on those absences. So next year, every school will have an attendance agent and that attendance agent will focus on students that are truant doing home visits. Uh, we've also um, started home visits, uh, teacher home visits this year. Um, and pilot that in, in several schools, many of them partnership schools, because we need to create better relationships between our teachers and our, our parents. Um, and then I'll talk about the Parent Academy later. Um, but um, I think those are some of the answers um, to your question. Special well. education. So um, we asked uh, the, um, the Council of Great City Schools to come to Detroit to do an audit uh, and tell us exactly what exact, where are our gaps, what is broken, and what are some recommendations moving forward. We interview teachers, principals, parents, um, and uh, we have the draft of that plan that will go to our board in about a month. Uh, and we also uh, created a, we're not calling it special ed, we're calling it exceptional student education, uh, which I think is more best practice um, regarding the term. And that ESE plan is going to our board in a month, which outlines a reorganization, but also solid steps in improving um, special education, ESE services. Um, and so I can speak to that more in, in the presentation as well. It's one of the points that I'm going to highlight. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Cassandra? Uh, so Michelle actually introduced a number of the things that I had, but in the interest of time, I think okay, uh, I'll, I'll wait until after your yeah, second. Thank you. So just here's our, our vision and mission. I think um, it's a legitimate question. So how do we rebuild the district, all the work that we have to do? You have to have a plan. 
Um, so you have to know how to get to point A to point B, and that's through our strategic plan. We engage hundreds of internal and external stakeholders on this plan, and uh, it is a reflection of where people um, in Detroit, in the school district and outside, those are supportive, want the district to go. So clearly you see our vision, all students will have the knowledge, skills, confidence necessary to thrive in our city, our nation, and our world. Our mission, we educate and empower every student and every community every day to build a stronger Detroit. So we have priority areas um, that I'm going to go over and talk about the strategies underneath them and I think addresses some of the questions that were already asked. You, you'll see some of these reiterated earlier from the uh, partnership agreement conversation, but expanded. So outstanding achievement is obviously one of our priority areas, and that means dramatically improving academic experience of all of our students to ensure that they are college and career ready. <clears throat> so I talked about new curriculum at the K-8 level. Also creating a very clear tiered system, especially early, early grades. Um, so you have core, all students are exposed to core. Then we go into tier two when students don't respond to the core. They need small group instruction based on the standards that they're, they're not ob obtaining and mastering and the skill defici deficiencies that exist. Um, one thing that we're doing is we're expand, we're having an academic interventionist work in, in all of our schools to work on, on students that need that extra intervention. It's very hard for a, a, a teacher with 25 students in the classroom, and more than half of those are below grade level, to move those students to proficiency on their own. So the academic interventionist is someone who's trained in our curriculum materials. Um, to provide intervention for students that are below grade level in small groups. Um, that's something that um, we start. We are starting to do lightly in early grades, but we'll expand across the district, mainly at the K-8 level. Um, in addition to that, um, all of our 10th and 11th graders will be in an SAT course. Um, we know that based on socioeconomic, socioeconomics, uh, lots of students are offered tutoring services after school in the summer, but our students don't often receive that. Um, so we want that to be a regular part of their school experience. So we are using Khan Academy uh, and other resources like um, uh, Algebra Nation to make sure that our students are exposed to SAT prep and, an, and a separate SAT class. Um, obviously, that's one of the accountability factors um, that the state reviews. <coughs> Uh, I mentioned the ESE audit that we did. Uh, we uh, conducted a restructuring at the central office level to provide direct support to schools. We, we did not have owners of particular work in special education. Um, it was rather uh, spread rather than focused on particular individuals leading work in particular schools. So I think that alignment will create uh, better support. We've created a, an advisory council at the district level of, of parents who have um, students with special needs. We meet with them once a month to go over initiatives and challenges that we're experiencing at the district level. Um, our overall challenge with ESE is fidelity uh, of implementation of the IEP, um, uh, responding to parent needs. I think that's the biggest issue is that we have to do a better job of responding day to day to issues and not waiting until they move to complaint or the legal process. Um, and, and that's what we're dedicated to in this reorganization and to the advisory council. The other area um, on, on student achievement um, is uh, the better assessments that I talked about in reducing assessments so that they actually yield data that's meaningful. Um, the work with the board has been at a very high level. I think a lot of people were worried about if an elected board could govern properly. And I can tell you that, um, just like all of you, I'm sure you don't always agree um, on everything, but uh, the seven-member elected board um, are really focused on kids um, and getting it right. And we have a great relationship. We don't always agree, um, but you're not reading about conflict in the newspaper, you're, you're reading about people um, focusing on students, focusing on reform, talking professionally about differences, and then voting, and then moving on. Um, and I think we have done a lot over the past year, and we'll continue to do that work into the future. Um, but one thing that we did is not only create a strategic plan, but metrics linked to just about everything 
um, that you can um, properly measure. And our vision in the next five years is to have um, uh, proficiency um, based on where the state is and where the, the district is in Detroit. So wherever we are in five years, we want to be half uh, as far as proficiency is as far as the state is concerned. And you might say, well, is that rigorous enough? Knowing where we are, that would mean on average probably a three percentage point increase in all proficiency areas throughout the district. And if we can do that, that would, that would exceed the average um, improvement in proficiency that the state is seeing district uh, statewide. Um, so we believe in five years we'll be better po positioned um, as far as student achievement. We also believe in five years we should see improvement on the NAEP assessment in fourth grade in particular in reading and math. Um, but this just gives you a snapshot of these goals over the years. Uh, it's not only part of the, our metrics of the strategic plan, it'll roll down to the principal level, but it'll also be a part of my evaluation as well. So transformative culture. Um, this is um, uh, one area of focus is the creation of a parent academy. We were able to raise private dollars to create a parent academy that builds the capacity of our parents to advocate for their children's education. Uh, I, I, we believe that all parents care about their child's education. Um, they sometimes just don't feel comfortable advocating. Sometimes they don't know how to navigate uh, red tra tape, bureaucracy. Sometimes they're not treated properly at schools. They don't feel comfortable. And so as humans, we all avoid what we're not good at. And sometimes parents feel hypocritical advocating for their child's education because they themselves didn't do well academically. Um, so the vision of the Parent Academy is to build the capacity of our parents by focusing on three major areas. One, um, offering classes to help our parents advocate academically. So we offer classes on how to promote literacy in the home, how to promote basic mathematics, how to promote higher level thinking skills in the classroom. So offering, asking higher order questions. So when very simple things, when parents are watching TV or watching the news with their child, ask your child, what do you think? Do you agree? Do you disagree with what someone said? Um, uh, reading the newspaper in front of them. Um, um, what questions to ask during a parent-teacher conference? How to fill out a FAFSA form for college aid? Um, the other focus is how to help our parents be better parents. So um, picking friends, dealing with discipline issues, um, dealing with anger management, conflict resolution, monitoring social media, um, dealing with boyfriend and girlfriend drama. Um, and then lastly, ha helping our parents overcome the natural challenges about showing up at school. So we offer financial literacy classes. We offer uh, English language classes for our newly arrived um, immigrant parents. Uh, we offer classes on how to create, how to write a resume, how to interview for a job. And so these are classes that I've already started to be offered. We've had over 500 parents participate only in, a, in the last couple of months. The feedback has been positive, and that's something that we're going to do at individual schools, but throughout the city. Um, we're revising our code of conduct that goes to the board actually tonight. Uh, that code of conduct um, focuses on in-school suspension, not out-of-school suspension. So we are having an in-school suspension facilitator at every school so that students can learn from the mistakes that they make rather than just being excluded from the learning environment. We think that is, particip that is influencing truancy um, and dropout rates. And so when uh, you'll see um, consequences for actions but an opportunity for students to make those mistakes and learn from them. Um, the Code of Conduct also implements restorative justice immediately in the Code of Conduct. So um, before moving to exclusionary practices, it's embedded in the Code of Conduct and required as a step along with parent engagement um, and, and, and again, in school consequences, not out of school consequences. Every school will have a Dean of Discipline who will be trained on positive behavior support. All of our schools will have to create a positive behavior support plan to recognize the positive, not the negative, uh, regarding behavior. Um, and then lastly, um, we have surveyed all of our um, constituents, so uh, whether there be parents, students, we surveyed this year, teachers, principals, and this is our baseline year of surveys, and, and 
we um, not only plan to use this as a measurement tool, but more importantly for training. And so in identifying best practices, where is, um, where is morale the highest? Where do uh, employees feel the most engaged? And what's happening at those schools or in those departments at the central office level that's leading to that higher level of engagement um, and ownership of the work? And how do we replicate that and scale that as a district? But if we're not measuring how people feel about the district, um, especially our parents will never improve. We'll just be guessing. Um, and this gives us research to tell us exactly what's working and not. Um, the whole child commitment, um, not only are we expanding music and art throughout the district, but also physical education. So all of our schools next year will have a physical education teacher um, or a gym teacher. Uh, we've also set aside a time in the schedule for recess um, and free play. Um, so this goes back to that emphasis on the whole child. Uh, we are also creating a cultural passport program where every kindergarten through fifth grader will go on three cultural experiences this year in Detroit. So our vision is that our uh, this next year's kindergartners, by the time they're in fifth grade, they get to experience everything that Detroit has to offer, from uh, the music hall to the Charles Wright Museum to the Detroit Institute of Arts. Um, but this is part of our uh, rebuilding of the, the whole child. Uh, we're also creating the 5,000 uh, role model program, with it, which specifically focuses on our young men, uh, especially African American and, and Latino Hispanic um, uh, young men, where we will have a, a school-based sponsor uh, have a separate class where they learn about uh, setting goals, um, working through anger management, conflict resolution, um, also uh, connecting them to mentors outside of the district. Um, and so that they can have experiences outside of school and have a day-to-day -day sponsor work with that cohort of students uh, to just go through the educational process. And then lastly, um, related to the whole child, um, is building of career academies. Our vision is that every school have a pathway to either college or the world of work. Um, so uh, many of our career academies are in name only. They're nice um, um, promotional opportunities on a pamphlet, but they're not being implemented with fidelity. So we did an audit, um, which we're building on into next year. Detroit has been very clear with where are the industries of the future, and we're going to align our career academies to those industries, uh, linked to medicine, linked to health, linked to robotics, um, STEM in general. Uh, and so Randolph is one of the best examples of that, where we have rebuilt Randolph to offer plumbing, carpentry, advanced manufacturing, um, but not only do we want career technical centers, but we want career academies in all schools um, so that uh, students can access that beyond the curriculum. We also are moving in a direction where every high school has accelerated programming. So you don't have to go to Renaissance or CAS to, to receive um, uh, college going courses. So our vision is that dual enrollment, for example, is offered at every high school in the next couple of years. Um, that an international baccalaureate is in every uh, quadrant of the city. Um, that, um, uh, that Cambridge, which is um, a program that's similar to international baccalaureate, is at every high school, um, or not at every high school, but every quadrant of the city um, and within every feeder pattern. So as we talk about choice, that, that parents and students have a legitimate option in their own neighborhood. Um, so that they can go to their neighborhood school and access either a college-going or career-ready um, uh, curriculum starting at the elementary level all the way up. Um, with exceptional talent, uh, our biggest challenge in Detroit was recognizing experience outside of Detroit. Uh, right or wrong, if a teacher, uh, let's say, for example, worked in Northville and they wanted to come to Detroit and had 10 years of experience, the district only recognized two years. And so this was a significant obstacle for us in recruiting teachers. Um, DFT uh, and the district uh, came to uh, an agreement only a couple of, about a month ago now, that starting next year we can fully recognize experience outside of Detroit. So I think this will make uh, a significant headway in recruiting those that once worked in Detroit and left, grew up in Detroit, and are working in other districts to come back to the city and work. Um, in addition to that, we not only increase teacher salaries, 
um, but also provided bonuses for those at the top so that we can prevent them from retiring as we rebuild our pipeline um, for new teachers. I talked about the new standards. I've talked about um, uh, the training linked to the standards and new curriculum. Uh, I talked about um, the surveys, but I also want to emphasize uh, secession management. And so starting next year, we will have principals shadowing administ district administrators so that we can build the pipeline of new district leaders, but we're also um, implementing programs to build new assistant principals and principals with residency-based programming. We want people to get experience doing the work, not just talking about the work. And I think that's um, uh, our strategy with building new leaders in a pipeline. Responsible stewardship, obviously, there's always talk um, previously about mismanagement of resources in Detroit. Uh, we are now going into year two of a balanced budget. Um, this year's budget was fully approved by the board and the FRC, the Financial Review Commission. Uh, this year's budget has a 10% set aside reserve, which is a rainy day fund, not linked to any initiatives or any um, expenditures. So no matter what happens with our budget, that 10% is set aside as a reserve. Um, that's 10% of our operating budget. We also have $20 million set aside in reoccurring revenue as contingency. Um, um, so that clearly shows that uh, we are being fiscally responsible short term and long term. Our budget is aligned to Blueprint 2020, which is our strategic plan. I talked about new initiatives around um, music and art teachers, for example. So it's not as if our budget is just stagnant. It's actively driving our reform. Um, I mentioned uh, music and art teachers, but we're also funding a guidance counselor at every one of our schools this year. So many of our schools did not have guidance counselors. So that's, again, linked to the whole child. We've identified 23 schools for a one-to-one -one, uh, device to student implementation. Uh, and all of those 23 schools will have interactive TV monitors, touch screens, so that um, uh, our students and teachers can have access to modern day technology. Uh, all of our teachers and school administrators will also receive a laptop. Uh, and this goes into building their capacity to use technology more frequently. Uh, at the end of this month, we'll have a facility review conducted. So we'll know what the ca capital needs of our district is. Um, that's a challenge into the future, but you can't uh, solve a problem unless you define the problem. And so that's what the facility review will do for us uh, as we go into next year. And then lastly, this is really just an overview of everything I talked about. And it gives you a sense of how we're looking at this reform over the next five years. Um, if you look at all the work that needs to be done, it can be daunting. Um, but I, I think this is also thinking about the fact that DPS did not deteriorate overnight. It, it was many, it was a couple decades and obviously years in the making. So as we think about rebuilding the district, we're moving with a sense of urgency. We have metrics that show improvement every year, but we also have to think about this in a sustainable, long-term way. We're not going to rebuild the district in one year. It's thinking about this incrementally, but being aggressive and strategic as, as we do it as well. I signed a five-year contract. Frankly, I probably would have signed an even longer contract, but state statute only allowed me to, to sign a five-year contract. So, I'm, so we're thinking about this in, in year by year, but in the next five years, but then even after that, next five years of rebuilding the district. But this gives you a sense of, of five years. Year one was about building trust, as I talked about earlier, is that not coming in with an agenda, but coming in listening about what worked, what didn't work in the past, and what do we need to do differently. And I think our strategic plan was an organic articulation of how people saw the district and where it needed to go. A lot of work uh, reviewing systems and processes. People ask me, what were you most surprised about in coming into the job? It was lack of systems or processes for everything. Um, and so as we've identified those gaps and articulated the new systems, I think we have developed trust by listening to people as far as those gaps. Um, year two, as we go into next year, is about implementing the reform. Um, and so this is where the the new budget comes into play, the new positions, the new curriculum. Um, and so at the end of year two, we should see fewer vacancies. We should see signs of student achievement improving, especially in high fidelity schools. We have 115 schools. It's not going to happen overnight, but we should see pockets 
of movement as far as student achievement is concerned because those are going to be our high fidelity schools. In year three, we should see more proof of the reform implemented, more um, understanding of the reform, more articulation of the reform at schools. We should start seeing greater scale of improvement um, in year three or more schools improving as far as student achievement. Uh, we'll start working on a, a new evaluation tool. Our data systems are more mature. We have model classrooms. And then we have a line curriculum even at the high school level by year three. Year four is scale. And by year four, we should start seeing across the board improvement in literacy, math, SAT, graduation rate, enrollment. Um, and we're really starting to move at scale as a better, uh, more refined organization. Um, and then by year five, uh, it's about then refining. It's what, what has worked over the last couple of years, where are the gaps, and then rethinking a new set of priorities and plans in the future. And by year five, not only should we uh, have the gap between the district and the state by year five, but by year five, we're talking about the National Assessment for Educational Progress, the NAEP scores, improving with our fourth graders because those would have been this year's kindergartners that were associated with the reform over the next four years. So um, hopefully you get a good sense of what we're doing with our partnership schools, but uh, with the district as a whole. I'll begin with Cassandra mm -hmm. and go back through my list. Cassandra, Pam, Nikki, Lupe, Dr. Z, and Eileen. So uh, again, thank you very much for being here uh, today. And I think that the second part of your presentation did answer a lot of, of questions that I, I certainly had. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask something that's a little more open-ended. Sure. Uh, and what we have seen, I've been on the board for 12 years. A lot of us have been on for, for many, many years. Um, and, and some people here before I was. What, what I have seen in the city of Detroit is, um, and I think this is changing now, which is good, is the platform on which education was delivered in the city of Detroit was so unstable mm -hmm. uh, that um, it made it very difficult to do any kind of long-term planning because a lot of what happened was out of the control of the district, essentially. So I think you've done a great job here of presenting those things that you have control over and that you can really impact. I guess my question to you would be, what about those things, what keeps you up at night about mm -hmm. those things that are outside of your mm -hmm. control mm -hmm. that are going to either negatively or positively impact the results of what you're trying to do right now? And what would you ask state policymakers to either change or enhance that would make all of what you just presented um, stable and, and possible without pulling the rug out once again from the district? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, that it, I, I believe with, uh, with the right time, support, and resources, we can rebuild the district. Um, I'm going to emphasize the time issue. Um, and, and it doesn't mean that we aren't going to move. I mean, I think I've been able to articulate a whole year of work and what we're doing moving into the future. So we're not sitting back saying, well, leave us alone. We just need to be to, to, that in some ways we're creating excuses or not having a sense of urgency. But my fear is that uh, the upcoming governor's race um, upcoming elections at the at the legislative level um, could completely move the district and the state in a, in a different direction. I think we have stability right now. Um, we have some clarity on, on where we are and where we're headed. That's what worries me, is that, um, that, so, that in an aggressive way, we're going to move to policy that is ideological and not based on best practice and research. Um, where our time will be spent reacting to what is done um, here in Lansing or even at, at the national level in DC, rather than implementing true reform um, based on best practice. Um, and so what I would ask everyone to do is listen, is ask the same question that you asked. Um, and, I, and I do believe that late Superintendent Winston reflected that um, as far as MDE is concerned. And I think his team has done that uh, um, uh, since his passing even before, reflected that vision of truly partnering 
with districts, especially Detroit, about uh, not creating excuses. And I'm not giving that type of um, um, uh, that feedback, but problem solving. And I, I think I'm, you know, that's the, that problem solving is what is the problem and how do we work together to solve it? How, not ignore the problem, not impose something on you, but we have to move w with the end in mind, how do we get there? And where are the obstacles and how do we work together? How do we use the department's resources, the state resources to get you faster there with as least amount of pain as possible? And I think the partnership agreements were uh, an outstanding example of that and the legacies connected to that that we have to build off of into the future. Um, um, but I think the team as a whole has continued to represent um, late Superintendent Winston's vision of problem solving and partnering with districts. And it's a breath of fresh air because I actually worked at the Department of Education in Florida as a deputy chancellor. So I know what it's like to show up to a school or a district and say, we're here to help. And people look at you <laughs> with, you know, uh, uh, raise eyebrows when you say that. Um, but I do believe, um, the team has been reflective um, and problem solving based. And that's what we need more of. Um, so what keeps me up at night is a dramatic shift in a different direction, whether it's at the MDE level or um, uh, state or national. Um, the other thing that keeps me up at night is our facilities. Uh, we're gonna talk more about that at the end of the year. In the DPS to DPS-CD transition, we were only allocated $25 million for facility needs. That's a drop in the bucket considering how old our buildings are and the lack of maintenance over the past decades. Um, and so that's going to be a, a major challenge for us into the future. And our local property revenue, as you know, is going to pay the legacy debt. That was never forgiven. So that's paid off not until 2050. So that's a, a, a source of revenue that's not going to our day-to-day -day facility needs. So we'll talk more about that in the future, but those are things that, some of the things that keep me up at night. I, I and my team, teachers, principals, want to have time to educate children, not deal with politics. Um, that's a very broad, cliche statement, but I think we have enough history in Detroit and Michigan to refer back to regarding what we don't need to do um, moving forward. Let's not, re let's not repeat the mistakes of the past. Let's actually learn from them um, as we try to rebuild the, the, the school district. Pam? Thank you for the very thorough, for, be, for being here and your very thorough presentation. My questions, actually, you began to hit upon them in the ending of, of Cassandra's, and that was around um, the, the facilities themselves. Really happy to see the wraparound services and, and you all working with the healthcare uh, uh, groups and agencies to make sure that you're providing those type of wraparound services. But uh, um, obviously, um, Detroit brought attention to not only the aesthetics um, that are related to lack of maintenance, but also um, the exposures that children can have. And if we're talking about improving scores, we want children to be able to be present at school physically, mentally. So we want to make sure we're looking at the, you know, asthma triggers or things that may exacerbate uh, asthma and then children not showing up. And then obviously the childhood, uh, the neurotoxins that, that could be present in schools and just wanting to know um, what it is that you all are doing, um, not only as from audit perspective, but then ongoing, making sure that you're able to <coughs> monitor and maintain the buildings in that way as well. So um, one thing that we're doing is we are uh, testing the water in all of our schools. Um, that's aside from any federal or state or local mandate. Um, unfortunately, I've made the executive decision not to use the water in certain schools and rely on water coolers. Um, and so that's just um, to protect our children. Um, so we'll continue that water testing. We are developing an inspections team to go to school starting uh, in the fall to not only look at rodent concerns, but also safety to life issues. Um, and so again, define the problem, then move into solution, but you have to identify the problem and be transparent about what those problems are. Uh, so that will start um, in the fall. 
I, I, our buildings are challenging because they're outdated um, and there isn't an immediate source of revenue to fix them. Now, not all of our buildings are the same. Some are, are, are obviously uh, newer, but uh, um, that's, that's going to be a challenge long term. I think that's one of the greatest challenges at scale that we have is the quality of our facilities because when children come to school every day, the, the condition of their building um, gives them an indication of how people, wh how people really feel about the, the, their, their need for a quality education. Uh, they're not naive to know that in other neighborhoods and other communities, mm -hmm. uh, better facilities exist. But unfortunately, we don't have an immediate um, solution to the problem. Uh, the dollars that we do have, we are um, rapidly expanding them over the summer into the fall, mainly to, ref to repair roofs. Um, because the inadequate roofs has led to too much uh, water seepage, has led to uh, mold concerns and health issues. Um, so that's where we're putting the limited resources first, which I think will address other broader issues. Uh, we've hired a doctor um, full time on our team, um, and that's to uh, lead our nurses, many of which are contracted, and we want to change that as well to move to full time nurses, but mainly contracted right now. And that's to lead our nursing uh, team and core uh, to better serve students directly. But we also believe there's an opportunity in working with the city, uh, with hot local hospitals, to expand health clinics uh, throughout our district. Our vision, at least, is to start with a health clinic in every feeder pattern and building from there. Um, but I think we're making some initial inroads in, in addressing the whole child as far as health is concerned. And Dr. Atisha, he was here, um, your, your yes. physician came here um, and helped us to better understand the circumstances statewide, so that good. was good. Good, yeah. Thank you. Nikki? Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, you're very sincere and genuine. I can definitely palpate the heart that you have for Detroit, so I don't think anybody could make that mistake. Um, so that I'm grateful for that. It's exciting. Um, I am. I have a question in reference to focus area two, improving interventions. You you discuss literacy at that point. Also discuss city year, which is AmeriCorps. Um, I think Eileen, you mentioned something about the literacy presentation in March. Were you talking about Michigan Education Corps? Uh, no. Okay. So that, that was part of the support yeah. system that right. the department has worked with. Is that something that you're implementing? Yes. Okay. Yep. I, I just yeah. Yeah. That. And that's okay. part of that tier two intervention okay. um, for literacy. And then um, for math as well, when we look at the use of the academic interventionist. Um, but yes, that, that's part of our strategy to expand tier two intervention. Okay. Lupe? Um, Buenas tardes. I, I always in the morning. No, buenos dias. <laughs> <laughs> buenos dias. Still morning. It's still morning. But um, where can I start? I've been following you. I've been following your progress in Detroit. And um, I just listened to the, the forum that you had at, over at the island. Uh, and I loved what you had to say about public education being the vehicle to social change, uh, that public education is the means to social justice, and public education is the opportunity for all. I, I uh, concur with what Nikki just said. I, I feel your commitment this is a task that I commend you for taking because it was, it still is. But I feel your passion, your commitment, and your determination that it's going to turn around for the children, right. for the students. And I am, uh, I, I wish I could tell you I want to go work for you because <laughs> because uh, I did work in schools for a long time, and I see a, a, a good vision right here. I concur with your vision. I feel your vision, and in anything that I know that I I speak with the same voice, 
with this board, anything that we can do to help you with your vision, go visit, go speak, or whatever we can do, uh, we will do that. Now, one of the things that you talked about is the wraparound services that you're trying to implement within your district. I just went to visit um, Oak Ridge Public Schools, and I know Tom Lively would love to talk to you about his operation because it is outstanding. And I, that's Oak Ridge uh, Public Schools close to uh, Muskegon, and they have a wraparound uh, services for their students. I think what you envision happening in Detroit. Yeah. So anyway, I commend you and, and all your team because you don't do anything by yourself. Uh, it's all your team and the, the, the board. The board has been very persistent coming here almost monthly uh, to advocate for Detroit and advocate uh, themselves as elected officials. Uh, so, you know, I, I, it's phenomenal what you're doing. And, and you've only been there how long? A year? A year. A year, and you have a plan. You have a vision in writing, and I salute you. Thank you, and and please visit. Uh, thank you for mentioning that. I was going to end with that, but it, at any time that you're available, we would uh, love to take you to some schools to see uh, our work and and the work that still needs to happen as well. Dr. Z. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've lived in Detroit most of my life and uh, wrote a dissertation on school closings in the 1990s, and a lot of the factors behind that uh, continue today and get very little play in the public debate. Um, there's a saying, you know, we often overestimate what we can do in the short term and underestimate what we can do in the long term. Uh, and I see uh, from your plan and just from other things that I've that I've observed that that you're in for the long term and and uh, certainly um, wish you every success. Uh, I, I think it's been very wise that you've tried to pull get everybody together on the same page and that takes a lot of patience and uh, uh, I, I, I can uh, see a lot of progress uh, in in that respect. Um, and uh, I guess I would ask you to um, what uh, just to say a little bit more about the the culture that you hope to see in our individual schools. I'm very sensitive. To, I once went to a school where I was principal. I, you know, they had a big poster with Raven and the milk mustache, and are we? And I asked the the person to put up: Are we selling milk or are we selling Raven? You know. Uh, and without thinking, we sometimes fall into the Hollywood culture or, or, or values that are, I mean, we, we, think, we think that appealing to uh, Hollywood culture that we're relating to students, uh, when in fact, uh, you know, most half the kids in the school had, knew nothing about Raven, but uh, they, they sure found out after, uh, after going to the school lunch. So I'm curious about how, what kind of culture you, you are uh, foresee uh, in our schools? What things people think are important? Who are the people we admire and ought to imitate? Yeah, I would, um, you know, it's a, it's a question that I ask on uh, the principal interview. So I interview all of our principals before. I let the team go through the process and then they give me the finalist and then I select the principal at the end of that process. Um, and we're also including parents in that process slowly as we, we build that to, to come up with a, a group of finalists. But when you go back to the vision, um, you know, the, our vision, and I put it back on the screen, I, I, you know, in this country, um, and, I, and, and I would say in the, in, in, in the world, all human <laughs> beings... Talent is, is equally distributed among all of us. Opportunity is not. The vehicle that allows the talent to be realized is, is education. Um, and, and especially in Detroit, 
it has to be the vehicle that is utilized at greater scale and with more consistency for that talent to be realized. So when I've envisioned what happens at a school is that, that we accept and take children no matter what challenges they face. And, and, and our responsibility is to, to give that child back to work with the parent, to work with the family, to work with the community, to eventually give that child back um, who is closer to actualizing and realizing what that talent is. Um, and that, I believe, is done through core curriculum. It's done through interventions academically, but it's also done through the arts. It's done through electives. It's done through physical education. Um, but that can only happen if there's trust. And that there has to be trust between the teacher, the principal, and that child, and the parent, and the home. Um, and that's what we haven't done well across the board at scale. Uh, and I add that programs and curriculum also has to move to the individual child. You know, I often talk about that school, the school system was developed uh, during the age of the factory. Um, you know, mass, you know, it, we, we mass educate children. We still do. Um, we often treat children like widgets. Um, and they're individual, brilliant, beautiful people that we treat like widgets. And that's why children drop out. That's why children act out. That's why children don't reach their, their talent. And so we're, I'm, I'm envisioning and we are envisioning a set of individual schools that work awfully hard but smart um, to make sure that that trust is developed, the programs are individualized, the interventions are individualized, so students can reach their talent, which then means that they're college ready or career ready. Um, and it's a combination of the two. Um, so you have to have the right curriculum, the right program, but you also have to create the right culture. And that's why one of our priorities is transformative culture. Um, and that takes time, especially where we are right now, because there has been such distrust. There's been lack of responsiveness. There's been lack of accountability, uh, lack of ownership, lack of leadership. I can go on with the lacks. Um, but it's also time to move on. And, it, and it's time to take advantage of the opportunity that we have. And I, and I see signs of that happening. But it has to be scaled. Um, and that's, that's, that's what the time is about, is scaling it and problem solving to reach that point. Um, but that's the vision, is that ch children and I largely look forward to going to school every day because they're valued. Um, they're loved, cared for, they're pushed, but done in a loving, caring way. Um, just like strong parents do. And Eileen. Well, I wouldn't say I'm speechless, but that's about the best analysis I've heard yet of why we are in this, in this field. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I wanted to um, uh, say, too, that uh, you could have written Mark Tucker's recent essay in Education Week on how to align <laughs> schools for the future of children. Uh, it's absolutely spectacular to hear all of these programs in place and see all the, all the cogs starting to work. I wanted to ask you, with your experience in Miami-Dade, uh, both Miami-Dade and Detroit went into the trial urban district assessment of mm -hmm. the NAEP yeah. in 2000. Yeah. And there's been recent pushback against the NAEP's validity and its scoring mechanisms. I yeah. just wanted to ask you what value that had shown for Miami-Dade, whether Detroit's going to be continuing, obviously, from your last schematic, right. that's the case. Right. Yeah. And what you see, what impact it would have on Detroit for validation and also for uh, moving ahead. Yeah, I authentically, I, I'm always um, conflicted when it comes to standardized testing. Um, uh, I, I remember starting as a teacher in New York City before standardized testing. And I remember working my students very hard um, and down the hall, nothing was happening in the classroom. And I remember saying, we need a measure to hold people accountable um, <laughs> so that everyone is teaching, right? And, 
And I actually said that before I became a teacher. I, before I became a teacher, I was very anti-standardized testing uh, before I taught. And then when I taught without um, standardized testing, I became outraged because I thought that there was a lack of accountability and I thought standardized testing could bring some of that accountability. So uh, I was supportive. I have pushed um, accountability since um, uh, being in the classroom. And then over the years, I saw how the pendulum swung from no measurement, no conversation about um, making sure that children are learning to now everything being about a test, where we cut arts, we cut music, we double dose kids in reading without best practices. We, um, you know, everything and, and was about a test, which is one, should be one measure and looking at the, the whole child. So um, I'm now at a point professionally where I believe the pendulum should be in the middle, where you do have testing, but it's one aspect that's looked at. And so when I think about NAEP, uh, I think it's one of the only national uniformed measures that we can use to look at an apples to apples comparison of other large urban school districts. Our challenge in Detroit is at the end of the year when state results come out, it's really hard to look at us versus any other school district in Michigan because no district serves, um, there are other districts that serve uh, students with similar challenges but not at the scale and number. Um, and so it's really hard to look at, well, what do we look like versus, you know, are we moving in the right direction? Are we not? Um, so the NAEP allows us to have that measure. Uh, and for large urban school districts, I think that's important because you can be isolated when you're looking at, at, at performance. Um, but, I, but I do believe that it needs to be balanced. So the NAEP is not the end all. Uh, not, a standardized test is not. Uh, the end all for me is going to schools and seeing consistent high level teaching in every classroom, talking to children and saying, what do you think about your school? What do you think about your experience in this school? And children being able to say, I love my school. I love my teachers. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm supported but pushed academically. Kids will tell you. Uh, that's why when I go into classrooms, I immediately go to the child. Um, I watch instruction, but I, I, the child will tell you their experience. And that's why our surveys, I think, are important as we move forward. I would only add that uh, as we move towards scenario-based assessments, like the, uh, the NAEP tool, Correct. Yeah. which allow children to work through problems Correct. and use it's a real world agree. solution, it will really change the uh, reasons why we uh, do uh, yeah. sort of statewide or national testing. I agree. I, I think if, if we can evolve the type of testing, uh, I agree. I mean, the, the standardized test, the bubble test, is inefficient um, as a standalone to measure what children are learning and doing. And I think essay-based um, assessments, problem-based assessments, you're exactly right, are more indicative of the skills that students will need uh, and continue to need and need now to be um, not only competitive, but to be active citizens. Dr. Vitti, thank you very much thank you. for being with us this morning um, and for sharing with us your plan um, to transform and rebuild DPSCD. Um, from a personal perspective, it um, is very obvious in sitting here listening to you that you care deeply and passionately about the students and the staff at DPSCD. And we look forward to continuing to partner with you and share in this work that you and your team have um, put together in your plan to help you to transform and rebuild DPSCD for the benefit of the children of your community. So thank you so much for all you do. Thank you for having me and thank you for supporting. And please visit uh, when your time permits. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to clap. The final item on the Committee of the Whole agenda is a presentation on Child Care Development Fund State Plan and Market Rate Survey.
The Child Care and Development Fund is a $5.3 billion block grant program that provides funding to states, territories, and tribes to provide access to child care services for low-income families and improve the quality of child care. Every three years, the Michigan Department of Education submits a state plan for utilization of these dollars. As part of the state plan submission, states are also required to submit the results of their state market rate, their statewide market rate survey on child care costs and rates. The market rate survey is used to advise the setting of payment rates for providers. Today's presentation is an information item only, and our presenters are Shulan Doxy and Lisa Brewer Walraven. Good morning, and thank you for being here. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you um, as interim state superintendent Sheila Alice mentioned this is this presentation is for informational purposes as um, she will have the final sign off on the state plan when we present it originally um, they gave us a deadline of July 2nd to submit this but due to the length of the uh, state plan and I believe they probably had some technical difficulties the Office of Child Care has extended that deadline, and so the submission deadline is now August 31st. But again, this presentation is for informational purposes. Um, the state is required to submit this state plan every three years. You will hear throughout the presentation, as uh, Lisa will highlight, um, what we're working on through the state plan to improve child care in the state of Michigan, the connection to the top 10 and 10 as it relates to goal one and providing every child with access to high quality early child care. With that, I'll turn it over to Lisa Brewer Walraven. Good morning. Um, just want to start with a little bit of context about what these block grant dollars are used for. Uh, they are to help the state ensure that children birth through 12 who are low income and have high needs have access to high quality early learning programs. That might mean a full day program, it might mean a part day program, it might mean a before and after school program. Uh, but this is to support families and children in having that early learning experience. Last year, we served a little bit over 32,000 children with these block grant funds and ensured that they had access to those high quality program. Low income in terms of this program and its eligibility requirement means families who are at or below 130% of the federal poverty level. It also means that uh, some of those other categories you see on the slide would qualify them for the funding. We also look at whether or not parents are working, whether or not they're engaged in a training or education activity, whether they might be engaged in a family preservation activity, such as um, a, a program to support them, or uh, pr possibly participating in what we call an approved activity which could be something related to post-secondary education. Most of the children, most of those 32,000 children who qualified last year had parents who were working. Uh, this is a large block grant. Uh, and while the Department of Education within the Office of Great Start in the P through 20 System and Student Transition Division implements the program. We can't do it without all of the partners you see listed here on the screen. Um, we utilize these partners to help develop the plan as well as carry out the provisions or the rules and regulations uh, throughout the year. We utilize the Department of Health and Human Services to help us determine the eligibility of the children and families who are participating. We work with licensing and regulatory affairs uh, to ensure that licensing um, is going out and in visiting programs to make sure they're meeting health and safety requirements and providing good early learning opportunities for children. 
And then we have a host of partners who help us meet the quality provisions of the funding uh, by implementing Great Start to Quality, which is our quality rating improvement system, by offering scholarships to those who are working in the field to help them earn a degree, um, by implementing what is called a registry, which helps those individuals who are working in the field track their training and education and move along a career pathway. And then, of course, our Great Start Collaboratives and Parent Coalitions who are working at the community level to help address systems issues for families and children. Um, we have two primary roadmaps that are helping us influence goal one of the top 10 and 10 goals here at the department. Um, and those are what we uh, know as the block grant reauthorization rules and a report that was commissioned by the Office of Great Start called the Building a Better Child Care System Report. And that results of that report were presented to you in September of 2016. Uh, so putting those two elements together really helps us ensure that we are, again, supporting children, supporting families, and supporting those providers who are working with those children. When you think about the state plan, it can be a little bit daunting. Uh, Shalon already mentioned they extended our due date into August for this plan. Um, it covers the period of October 1, 2018 through September 30 of 2021. So it is a three-year plan. They're asking us in that plan to demonstrate what we are currently doing in Michigan related to all of the rules and regulations. And if we are not currently doing something when we submit that plan in August, we will have until September 30th to submit an amendment to demonstrate that we are com in compliance with all of the provisions. This plan lives at the Department of Education website. Anytime that we make an amendment to this plan or make a change, uh, we repost the plan so that the most current plan is available for the public to utilize. The plan has eight sections. These eight sections, again, are focused on what are we doing to meet the needs of parents? What are we doing to ensure that children have access to high quality early learning experiences? What are we doing to ensure the health and safety of children in those settings? And how are we meeting the needs of providers? Uh, when you received the information about this agenda item today, you should have also received a summary document that summary document highlighted a lot of changes that we have been implementing. And I just want to take a moment to touch on a few of those uh, because they have been rather significant uh, in terms of impact for parents, providers, and children. Um, when you think about children's experiences, we know that continuity of care uh, has been linked not only to outcomes related to their social emotional development, but also to their cognitive abilities. And we also know that that continuity of care helps support parents who are working towards self-sufficiency on their own. So a, a benefit again across the, the three groups. 12-month continuous eligibility and the graduated exit um, removed what we once called a cliff, quote unquote, in Michigan. And what that cliff meant was, as a family was approved to receive the assistance with the early learning or child care, um, if they had a slight increase in their income, their case would automatically close and those children and families would lose the opportunity to continue to attend that program. Um, so what 12-month continuous eligibility in the graduated exit did was ensured they're eligible for 12 months, even if there is a change during that 12-month period. And it allows families who are receiving the assistance to have income increases and continue to receive the assistance. 
So the assistance range is now between 130% of the federal poverty level and about 250% of the federal poverty level. So really stopped that cliff for families. Um, We've been working to increase access to higher quality programs. Part of that strategy is called tiered reimbursement. So the programs who have higher star ratings receive a higher reimbursement rate, which helps families with the cost of that care. Currently, the majority of the children who receive the subsidy assistance are in a three-star rated program or higher, and we have a five-star rating system. We worked hard to reduce the wait time for families once they submit an application. Not only have we reduced that wait time from 45 to 30 days, but we have also worked with the Department of Health and Human Services to reduce the length or the size of the application that they are filling out. Uh, its size has been reduced by 80%, and the number of words have been dramatically reduced on that application. Uh, we've been working hard to remove barriers for migrant and homeless families in terms of getting access to the program, as well as increasing the number of child care licensing consultants who are able to visit the programs and provide consultation. Uh, we used to have a ratio of about 150 programs to one licensing consultant. Our average now is at 1 to 98 programs. So um, expanding their ability to meet with programs. While we've accomplished a lot, there are still uh, things under reauthorization that we're working diligently to meet uh, the September 30 deadline for. Uh, we've been taking in recommendations from others. Uh, and at this point, are waiting for some systems modifications to happen, and we uh, should be set for moving these forward. Um, we have a group of providers in Michigan that we currently call unlicensed providers. Some of you may know them as family, friends, and neighbors. Um, they often provide care uh, during what we also call non-traditional hours, weekends, evenings. We are moving to calling them license-exempt providers to come into compliance with the law. Um, in addition to changing that name, uh, we'll be looking at whether or not they are related to the child or not related to the child. For those individuals who are not related to the child, uh, we will be doing on-site visits with those providers. They are not meant to be punitive visits, but they are meant to be visits to support that provider who is often isolated for many of the supports that are offered due to the time that they're providing care. So they are, again, meant for a resource or a support to those providers. Uh, under the regulations, we will also be required to do an FBI fingerprint for those unrelated providers. So we will be moving to come into compliance with that. We know that there are often reasons that children need to be absent or missing from the program that they are attending. Currently, we offer reimbursement for 208 absence hours in a year. Uh, to come into compliance with the rules and regulations, we'll be re increasing that to 360 hours in the year. Again, providing more supports for children, families, and providers. Another thing that we know is that often programs are charging parents what might be called registration fees. They might be to help purchase supplies, they might be to hold a slot, they might be for field trips. Uh, that's often a burden that these low-income families can't afford. Uh, so we're going to be moving to reimbursing providers and helping families cover the cost of a portion of those registration fees. We're working on a, a website page that will be a one-stop location for parents to find information about programs, to find information about child development, and to be connected to other resources that might help them. We're also working to make sure 
uh, that parents have better information about child care programs and early learning programs that they might be considering for their child by making licensing reports more readily accessible and by helping them understand the rating that a program may have as they're looking at the options that they have for their child. So those are our big ones that are left that we're uh, diligently working on over the, the summer. Is there still race to the top funding for those? For the race to the top for the, the mm -hmm. race to the top funds um, in this program year or for the license year. exempt for all of the race to the top activities 12 30 2018. Another big component of uh, the submission of the state plan is something called a market rate survey which Sheila described for you. The purpose of the market rate survey is for the state to get a sense of what does child care or early learning cost in Michigan. Um, they want to know what the cost is by geographic area, by type of provider, uh, by age of child, by the quality level of the program. They want to know how much does it cost for providers to implement the health and safety requirements? Uh, what does it cost to provide higher quality care? So the department issued a request for proposals and through that process, the award went to Public Policy Associates and they helped us conduct our statewide market rate survey. And I just want to give you a glimpse of what we learned through that market rate survey. Um, one of our biggest goals this year in doing the market rate survey was to increase our response rate. Historically, we've had a very low response rate to the market rate survey, never really getting higher than a 15% response rate. Uh, in 2015, we had an 11% response rate. It might not seem like a lot, but when we set our goal to get to 25%, we knew it was going to be a heavy lift. I'm happy to say we reached a 29% response rate of the 2,705 2, providers uh, who responded. You can see what type of program they were from. We had one response from every county in Michigan. And we hit that 25% response rate in each of our Great Start to Quality uh, regions, and we have 10 of those across the state. We also had three tribal providers who participated in our market rate survey, and 90% of the providers who responded to the survey indicated that they provide care for a child who is receiving subsidy. So this did give us a very good look at those uh, providers and, and how the program is impacting them. We learned that 88.7% of children are in the care um, of a licensed child care center. We learned that home providers are the providers who are primarily caring for infants and toddlers. We learned that 94% of our providers charge a weekly rate or I have a weekly tuition rate. We pay an hourly rate, so you can see that we have a difference there. We learned that our CDC reimbursement rate to the providers to help the parents cover the cost of care is well below the 75th percentile, which is the recommended rate that states are paying providers. We learned that rates do vary depending on the age of the child, the type of facility, the quality rating. Uh, we know that rates charged by child care centers are 50% higher for infants and toddlers than those same rates in homes for infants and toddlers. We learned that um, 90% of child care centers have those fees that I mentioned a moment ago, and those fees range between $50 and $60 a year. We learned that three-fourths or three-quarters of uh, the individuals who responded to the survey um, 
are um, not charging families the full cost of their care. So what that means is they're choosing to take a cut in their rates to serve those low-income families, um, often finding other ways to cover the cost for those families. We also learned, uh, I mentioned non-traditional care earlier. Um, we know that about 16% of the providers who responded to the survey provide care on the evening, about 4% on the weekend. And so you can see that that kind of care is very difficult for families to access. Uh, Public Policy Associates ultimately made four recommendations to the department based on what they found do doing this survey. Um, they really encouraged the department to look at increasing the subsidy rates for providers, bringing them more in line with what the market rate is. They recommended a switch from hourly payments to a weekly or daily payment schedule to be more in line with what providers are charging families. Uh, they encouraged the department to look at bringing in additional funding to help providers with quality improvements and supports that are needed in their pro programs to help them move to a higher quality rating. And they recommended the department looking at helping with the cost of registration fees. Again, as part of the entire plan process, we're required to get public comment. And we worked really hard to expand the number of comments that we were able to receive uh, through the plan this year, as well as on the market rate survey, which was a new requirement. We tried to expand the ways that were available for stakeholders to participate. And we tripled the amount of public comment that we received this year compared to previous years. We had parents who commented. We had providers who commented. We had DHHS local office staff who commented, resource center staff, collaboratives, and parent coalitions, as well as other stakeholders um, who helped uh, provide comments. These are some of the opportunities that we offered. Uh, to ensure that individuals had a variety of ways to provide comments. Uh, one popular way for people to provide comments was through a survey option, which was new for us this year. Uh, that allowed us to give some specific questions or specific sections of either the market rate survey or the state plan for people to look at and respond to. This slide gives you a high-level overview or a snapshot of the comments that we received on the state plan. Uh, we did try and utilize multiple outreach strategies, listservs, websites, social media, um, MDE um, activities to make people aware of the opportunity. What was interesting in this round of comments is that we had 33 for-profit child care centers who chose to respond to uh, the state plan, as well as 79 individuals who are also providers who um, used a common template, if you will, to submit comments, but they did submit comments. Here are some of our most common responses. Um, again, talking to the department about how low our reimbursement rates are and how they really aren't reflective of the true cost of care. Uh, encouraging the department to look at grants in order to help programs better serve uh, the underserved populations that we have. About 60% of the comments were focused around how we could utilize grants to help expand opportunities for programs and families. Uh, suggestions for looking at our eligibility criteria and how we can, again, look at better meeting the needs of underserved populations like infants and toddlers, 
special needs children, children living in poverty, children are, who are homeless or who need that non-traditional care. And that was probably around 50% of the responses were focused in that area. 75% of the comments were about the non-traditional hours of care and how the department should look to address that area. We also had comments about supporting the workforce and ensuring that we were looking at ways for increasing communication to parents and providers. When we look at the market rate survey comments in particular, we had 205 people who responded to the survey specific to the market rates. Uh, again, providing us very useful information as we move forward in terms of looking at how to adjust or, or modify the rates. Um, child care providers were, were the biggest group who responded to, to this survey. The primary responses uh, to this survey, uh, were, uh, particularly on the first bullet, were different from the state plan. In this survey, they said they were not aware of some of those changes that I highlighted for you, like 12-month continuous eligibility or the graduated exit um, or the reduction in application times. So we need to do some work on continuing to promote those changes that we've made in the, the program. 74% of the people who responded said providers should receive higher rates. 77% said we should seek out additional funding to offer grants. And 69% agreed that um, providers would benefit if we switched to a daily or a weekly reimbursement. So you can see comments were similar across the two documents, uh, even though we uh, were required to get comments on them separately. The biggest barriers that were reported to us from the stakeholders were the reimbursement rates. It prohibits providers from accepting children who receive the assistance um, because they're worried about not being able to collect the difference between the subsidy rate and their tuition rate. Communication continues to be a barrier and delays in application processing. So again, some more things for us to focus on and work towards improving. I know we took a very quick walk through uh, both of those pieces. Thank you for letting us come to share this information um, and update you on where we are with implementing the, the new requirements under the law. Uh, Shalana, I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, I see a question from Dr. Z and then from Tom. Okay. Uh, first, a comment. You had a lot of figures uh, here which could have been included on the presentation, and um, that uh, would have been helpful. And one of those figures is the amount of the block grant. What was that again? So the amount of the block grant depends on the age of the child and the I'm type of setting. Statewide. 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 The aggregate. Uh, in the state, we receive a little bit over $200 million to implement the program currently. Okay. And uh, currently, in this past year, uh, how, this is $200 million a year? It, the appropriation varies per year. It's based on our caseload. So when the legislature works on our appropriation, they look at how many children and families we served in the prior year, and that's how they determine our appropriation. Uh, okay, so this was $200 million. Uh, For this year, we're at about $200 million, yes. Okay. And how many, um, how many students were served this year with the $200 million? So in this fiscal year, we're uh, still around about 33,000 children being served. Our cases are going up slightly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that was one of my main questions. The other was, uh, you said some of the parents are not working. So why, <clears throat> why is there child care if they're not working? 
So another eligibility factor could be that they're engaged in a training or education okay. program. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the unlicensed uh, being including family, that was something when I was in the legislature was a sticking point. Are, are you saying that they now need uh, like a family in order to be able to have the kids come over after school, they have to be, you know, get fingerprinted and some of these things that you mentioned now? And is that a federal requirement? So for those who are related, uh, we do do state background checks, but they will not receive the FBI fingerprint. The federal government allows us to waive that requirement for those who are okay. related. However, they still do complete a health and safety training course, which includes CPR and first aid, uh, to help support them in the care for that the children. That includes neighbors and stuff. I'm sure that so many people don't do this or they don't know about it, that you know, kids come home and they hang out at the fam friend for an hour or so and <coughs> mom or dad gets home. I mean, is there punishments? I mean, I hope that it's pretty... You know, I, I, I guess, yeah, I guess that would be my question is if... Um, are there punishments for not doing something like this, uh, for getting the, uh, uh, for unlicensed that don't, don't have these items, whether it's the fingerprinting or the other items that are required? The, the requirements that I was mentioning for the category of unlicensed or license exempt providers are for those who are caring for subsidy, subsidy oh. children. So oh, okay. only if the family or the child okay. is receiving right. the subsidy. Okay, never mind. Thank you. Okay. Um, Michelle, and then back to Dr. Oh, Z. Okay. Um, about a year or so ago, um, uh, I got a call from someone. My former babysitter is a director of a child care center out in Livonia, and so I got to hear some of the concerns that she had firsthand, and I'll just relay them, too. <laughs> um, the, clearly, the subsidy was not adequate. And it was a real problem because then they would bill the parents. Parents were under the impression or had been told by somebody in the state that they would cover 100% and they didn't owe anything. So they had this dispute going back and forth where the parent was under the impression that the provider couldn't charge additional fees. Um, and they were saying they, that's, that's how they operate. So I'm, my understanding is that from hearing this is that the provider the subsidy only covers whatever it covers, and if the tuition is more, the parent has to pay, correct? Um, so they were just having a hard time given the low uh, reimbursement and the, you know, the, you know, they're often poor families that can't afford a lot of uh, money to, and that are trying to work uh, um, scraping by. But um, she said the other thing was with the scholarship, um, it would, be, it would have been helpful if the money could have been given up front as a scholarship because some of the people, to get the extra star, to have enough people, they have to front the money or the employee has to front the money. And that is often a barrier. Um, even though it's like $450, $500, I think, for the training, for some folks that's a real barrier and it would be helpful even if it was like half up front and half later or something <laughs> instead of waiting till after. Um, that that would, and then they could charge more because they'd have more stars or get a better subsidy because they would have more stars. Um, and then the other was the, um, the curriculum. They were, seemed to be confused about exactly what was required of them and questioned some of the curriculum and how appropriate it was. And they didn't feel they had any way to provide feedback on the appropriateness of what they were told they had to teach. So I don't know if the providers have any say in what's required in terms of what they're supposed to be doing with the kids. So um, anyway, that was the feedback that I heard. But um, I think I think every, you know I think it's really valuable what what is providing this child care. There's so many people that need it desperately. Um, especially now that they're talking about making people, in order to receive Medicaid, have to work. They will definitely need that support. And um, I think it would be um, incumbent upon the same legislators who, who wanted to do this work rule to also provide funding, to spearhead funding, to make sure that the people had the support that they needed to work. 
And then, thank you, Dr. Z. Okay. Um, I was going to ask of the $200 uh, uh, million, uh, what about how much of this is reimbursement? Is it all, or is it, I mean, or, or out of this, do you have our other programs paid for? Um, so the, the $200 million is primarily for the subsidy reimbursement. Federal regulations require that we spend uh, from our appropriations 70 percent on reimbursement for uh, the families for the child care cost. So um, the, that $200 figure that I gave you, I was answering specifically for the subsidy. Um, but the other funding that we have I can give you uh, that figure. We can send that as a follow-up that supports the quality activities like Great Start to Quality, Teach, Child Care Licensing, et cetera. Okay. Um, I'm not, uh, that won't be necessary. But I'm just thinking aloud here. This, uh, so roughly 6,000, uh, if you've got 33,000 kids, that's roughly 6,000 a kid. At fifteen dollars an hour uh, for child care, that would be roughly four hundred hours. Uh, Fifty weeks uh, out of the year would be roughly eight hours a week. So I just want to get a feel for what this, what the grant really translates into. So uh, each month we look at how many cases have received a payment. Uh, the number of children on those cases, and then we determine what is called a cost per case. So it's an average cost per case once we look at all of the payments that have gone out for a month. Um, currently, the average cost um, is close to $600. Um, we track that from month to month as well as utilize that information about the number of cases for that annual legislative appropriation in terms of number of cases. Cost per case is roughly $600, and that's over what, for what period of time? That's a monthly average. Month, thank you. If there aren't any other comments or questions, then I will thank Lisa and Shulan for being here. Thank you. And we have one last item on the Committee of the Whole agenda. It's the discussion regarding criteria for grant programs. You will see four criteria listed for four grants. Those four grants are all federal grants. Do you have any grant criteria questions for staff? I do. Tom? Um, simply, there's just the one on the D the D2, the 1.9 million, it said that uh, the programs and activities funded by this grant must include participation by eligible private school children and teachers. And I was wondering what that means. So this is the title. And that could be part. answered when it comes up. I could pull it from the consent agenda and they can answer it, or if somebody can answer it real quick now. Okay, we will get an answer. Okay. Pardon me. We'll, we'll get an answer for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we will recess for lunch. It is now 12.26. We'll recess till we, 1? Or? We could recess till 1, one fifteen. You tell me what you would like. Does anybody need more than 35 minutes for lunch? We do, do I don't it. know, because I was going to have some people come and visit with me at noon. So uh, I think I'd need my... Hour. We do one fifteen. One fifteen. Yes. 